And we're back, episode 27. We are joined today by our special guest, Andy Starnes. That's Sean. I'm Nick. Andy, welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. Good to see you, brother. Uh, always good to talk to you. So we're looking forward to uh, hopefully 90 minutes of jam-packed uh, information, knowledge, some passion. Uh, maybe get you a little little wound up toward, towards the end there. <laughs> so uh, that being said, man, uh, really honored to have you here. It's uh, been a long time coming. So um, just want to dive right in, kind of give us a brief background, uh, where you're at in the fire service, uh, where you came from, and uh, kind of what get, you know got you into thermal imaging. Where I'm at in the fire service, that's a really interesting question right now. Um, I am uh, currently 32 years into my journey since I started officially playing with it. I've been chasing my dad since I was eight years old, going to the volunteer fire station and got became a junior firefighter when i was legal 15 16 years of age and got hired as a career firefighter at 22 and i'm 48 so you do the math so um currently serve as a battalion chief in a large metropolitan department in north carolina and i am uh, currently eight nine months from retirement i'm not leaving the fire service but i'm leaving my fire department um I've given it my all. I've had 25 good years, and I look forward to the next chapter. I'm very uh, interested, obviously, in two things, firefighter behavior and fire behavior. Uh, I think one influences the other, and I got into one of those because of my dad, the fire behavior aspect, and I got into the firefighter behavior aspect because of my own brokenness, stupidity, trials, and tribulations, and now I'm very active in peer support and helping people get out of the hole or just sit in the hole with them until they're ready to come out. Uh, Cause I think we're all broken. Some just don't, some just don't admit it. And uh, my, my statement I always make is you wouldn't take a two and a half up the stairs to a, tw- a two story house fire by yourself. Why are you going to fight the fires of your life by yourself? So I'm passionate about those. I'm openly vulnerable about my own flaws and I'm, you know, I'm going to tell you straight up, I'm chief of sinners, as Paul says. I'm not going to beat my chest at anybody or look down at anybody unless I'm trying to help them. But I'm very, very passionate about those two things. And thermal imaging is something that I literally fell into, Nick. I was helping my dad, having fun, and I fell through a floor and ripped my knee in half and almost disabled myself due to that injury and spent six months out of work. And my wife politely informed me that if I was going to play thermal imaging guy with my dad that I needed to go get insurance and make it legal because I was going to get disability for what I did. And she said, we can't live without you or disability. And as she was carrying me to the bathroom, I said, for better or worse, you meant it. She goes, get better. You're heavy. <laughs> uh, so, so I took that seriously. And in 2015 formed insight training and went to school. Cause I guess what I learned firefighters don't go to school for thermal imaging. Everybody else does. We go like this. Your, your, here's your device, here's your turn it on, uh, you know, read that little number in the bottom right-hand corner and it can't see through glass, have a nice day, if you get that much, or a PowerPoint on vector solutions now it's called. So um, everybody else requires 32 hours of training and they don't run into burning buildings, but we require one type of training per year and most people don't even do that. So I'm trying to help people do two things, brother see the hidden things going on in their lives and see the hidden danger inside of a fire so they can mitigate it and serve the citizen straight to the point. That's, that's pretty much what I'm doing. I'm blessed to have a large cadre now started with just me. And now we're up to 14 guys and spread across the country. And I'm working with two international guys. Now we've trained in all 50 States, helped firefighters in 20 countries, wrote the first thermography based curriculum in existence for firefighters. And we'll release the first collegiate level curriculum this year. And that is nothing I did. That's the good Lord working through a broken instrument because all something bad happened to me. And I met cool people like you and and you guys and learned from y'all as much as like Sean will tell you about recent trip to West Virginia where I got to hang out with some amazing people and listen and learn. So that's my short version. So uh, blessed to have a wonderful family live here in Shelby, North Carolina and Looking forward to what God's got in store next because it's all for him. Yeah, well said, brother. Well said. So, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's funny how things work out, right? You know, Mm -hmm. 
a <laughs> negative ex- negative experience ultimately uh, end up bringing a lot of blessings along the way, you know, with the opportunity to get into what you're in now and doing some of the stuff you're doing. So uh, this goes to show that sometimes what we think is a setback is actually an opportunity for us to kind of reset and kind of find our way in some other things. I agree. I think it was called the control alt delete button. He made me stop. He's like, stop. Boom. Yeah. Put put me on the back. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Which yeah. way do I go now? Oh. Yeah. Sometimes we need that. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's, that's well, for sure. But um, I'm definitely I'm definitely hard headed, so I need it. <laughs> yeah. Well, like most of us are, right? Very stubborn. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna back into your intro for for a minute. Um, I just want to let everybody know how I first met you. Uh, was actually through one of your trainings when you came to Florida um, mm-hmm. back in, I think it was like 2018, something like mm-hmm. that. Um, so, yeah. yeah, right there in Apopka. And, and I'll tell you this, um, you know, that was my first real introduction to thermal imaging at all. First formal training, anything. And I just oh. remember walking out of that training, just utterly amazed, realizing that one, I just got a wealth of information, but two, I didn't know a damn thing about something that's probably one of the most instrumental things on the fire ground that we use. Right. Um, so I, w- I wanted to kind of bring that up because I wanted to see what you're seeing. You travel around a lot. Um, thermal imaging, you know, it's, it's been around a little while. So mm-hmm. in, in your opinion, why do you feel like us in the fire service, we're good at all these other things, right? Force entry, search and rescue, like, all of it. Why thermal imaging? Why do you think that's taking a back seat? Well, I would challenge that. We're good at everything statement very closely because the, if the public knew how many services we had to provide and how little our actual depth of training on that, I think it would scare them. You know, because you think about it, you've got to be an active shooter expert, homeland security expert. You've got to be an IMT you know, incident management team, guy or gal, you've got to be a paramedic, you've got to be a hazmat guru, you've got to be a vehicle extrication, you've got to be high angle rescue, you, you've got to all these other stuff. Now they're going to add, you know, legal ethical training in here, company officer, firefighter one and two takes a back seat. Think about that. Everything else you got to do training. Firefighter one and two, your basic fundamental stuff, you know, it's not really improving unless you get outside of your department. There's some jam up departments doing some, you know, next level stuff, not, not disrespect that, but most of them are doing, you know, whatever the textbook says, trying to hit, hit the state benchmark or state minimum standard. And I learned this when I went through thermography training, when the first page says, if you pass this course, you will receive a certification, which is a written testimony of verification that you pass this test qualification rest with your company. Let me repeat that again. Qualification rests with your company. Qualification, meaning you are a qualified firefighter and wherever you function, engine, ladder, rescue, whatever, rests with the people you work with, not just the fire department, rest with you and, and them. But thermal imaging, in my opinion, Sean, to, to circle back around, I think presence doesn't equate to proficiency. I have a smartphone. Doesn't mean I am a smart user. Okay. I didn't start using this phone to even a percentage of what it could be until I started this business and training in thermal imaging. Then I learned, oh, I can connect my MacBook. I can do this. I can do all that. Make my life easier, right? Thermal imaging started off pretty intense. If you look at the godfathers of thermal imaging, the safe IRs and the people who first started it, and that was where they said the manufacturers then partnered. and they, they provided the training when you purchased the device. Somewhere along the lines, that disappeared. Because what's the smallest budget in your department, the next department, in any department, typically? Training. But yet we have to perform like gold medal athletes. In my opinion, if you look at everybody's training budgets and their training schedules, the two areas that get left out, neglected, or not even touched are thermal imaging and behavioral health, which are the two areas I'm most passionate about. Um, And I think a lot of it comes along with it came out. It was really intense. Everybody thought they knew what they knew about it, and that was it. But, I mean, if you look at a cell phone from 20 years ago and a cell phone today, dramatic difference, right? Dramatic difference in your TV and your computer and technology. 
Look at your SCBA. Look at your fire truck. I mean, the, the pump panel, for example, how much that's changed, right? You know, the, the, the hydraulics behind it hasn't changed, but the, the operations and all the wires and bells and whistles have. And thermal imaging in general, the infrared technology as far as absorbing heat, it's a resistor-based technology, and then it interprets it and displays an image. That part hadn't changed, but all the software, the pixel pitch, the, the technology, and how many pixels they've got. I mean, think about it. 20-something years ago, the best you could get was a 160 by 120 detector, which is 19,200 pixels. If I gave you a 19,200 pixel TV, you and your family would be mad. I mean, the image quality is horrible. I mean, you're not going to see squat. And 20-something years, 30 years later, we're still selling 160 by 120 cameras to fire departments and calling it innovative. You know what I call it? Profit margin. Because it's cheap, I can make it for this, and I can sell it for that. It's a no-brainer. And I impress upon an, a consumer who thinks it's innovative, and it's not. I mean, you look at, in 2014, DARPA re released a 1400 by 760 detector in 2014. Today, a civilian can buy what looks like a 35-millimeter camera. It's an infrared camera that can see, listen to this, can pick up. 1.3 million pixels is the detector size. You can pick up the temperature measure or the heat measurements off of dust flakes in the air with that camera. But the best you can buy on the market right now for a handheld new is 320 by 240, which is 76,800 pixels. So you're telling me a civilian can go buy a million pixels, but you and I, the best we can get is 80,000 pixels. Your iPhone has more pixels than that. The bottom line is the reason why it's not focused on, it's never been validated to a point that it's been basically basically made, li you're liable if you don't use it. There's some liability behind it. They don't validate it by as far as rescues. I mean, even I love firefighter rescue survey, but they're not helping there. I mean, was a tick used? Yes or no? Really? That's like saying, was a Halligan bar used? Yes or no? You know, was it a three-piece Halligan? Who used it? The, the rookie or the senior guy? Was a nozzle used? Yes or no? Was it all the way open? Was it half bale Baptist, smooth bore Baptist? I don't know. Okay, that's that's not a good way to validate whether you know tick tick was used, victim survived. What tick? A Bullard MX from 1999? Uh, a situational awareness camera that I can't see past seven feet? Well, did they have training on it? Who knows? You know, we, we don't validate it. We I, and Look at some of the biggest research organizations we have. And I challenge you, it's the recent search study. Thanks for challenging me on, on that one too, Sean. I finished reading it. My head hurts. Um, <laughs> You're welcome. Great information. Truly inspirational. They're using 13-year-old thermal imaging cameras to provide the data for you and I to look at. Why? You got billions of dollars in government money, and you're using a Scott X380 and a Bullard T3X. Great cameras in 2013. It's 2023. When are we going to update the video quality so firefighters can actually see what's going on? If it's truly about them, you ask any military member who's a special ops person if they're going to give up their night vision and all the stuff they use to go get the bad guy. They're going to tell you you're crazy. They use that stuff. They're fundamentally sound, but they're drilling with that stuff on. But yet, no, I ain't using that thing. It whites out. The batteries suck. It fails me. And, uh, you know, it, you know that you, you're cheating, and that's really not beneficial. It slows me down. I can give you all the reasons why they don't use it, and half of them have to do with bad behaviors, old technology, lack of training education, standing up and not wiping the lens. You know how many of them, the majority of the camera use I find out, they failed just because they were standing up and they're wiping their face piece constantly. And they don't know to wipe the lens of the tick because it fogs up and then it produces a white, non-discernible detailed image. There's a litany of reasons why thermal imaging is not moving forward. And the majority of them fall upon us because we do the same thing with our education and training. When you look at something as simple as when I ask people if they understand their their uh, personal protective equipment or turnout gear. They don't. They know how to put it on. They know how to take it off. They don't know what the three-letter acronym TPP stands for, THL. They don't understand how how good their gear is at absorbing heat. You know, and I start challenging that. I'm like, okay, you don't even know how much heat you're absorbing 
and you're telling me you're waiting until you're in pain until you cool an environment when there's a child laying on the floor wearing polyester pajamas, shrink wrap into their skin, screaming for water, and you're worried about steaming the victim, upsetting the thermal balance, and causing unnecessary property damage. And when you're hurting in PPE, they're dead or dying in pajamas? What did that search study say? Within 90 to 100, no, 160 seconds at the three foot level, it was 162 degrees. 162 degrees destroys human skin. Why are we not making it tenable as we move towards our objective? I'm, I'm fine with putting a fire out, but that box is full of heat. The contents are full of heat, the walls are full of heat, and it's transferring to the people we swore to protect. And thermal imaging is taking a back seat because of the words aggressive. You can be aggressive, but you're not being intelligently aggressive. And I promise you, before I leave this earth, the fire service is going to be held liable for not using everything they can to help the citizen and the property owner. Because there's going to be enough data behind it that says this will help you find someone, whether you used it right or not. This will help you put the fire out faster. This will help you do your job better. And you chose not to use it. Why? Tell me why. I'm all about you share me some data, but don't give me opinion. Well, it slows me down. Well, if you stare at it like a TV, like my daughter does with her phone, yeah, it'll slow you down. But if you know what you're doing and you look at it and you communicate and put it down and then move like you're supposed to, it won't slow you down. You'll go straight to the target. But that's my story. No, dude, that's your you're spot on. And and honestly, man, you know, on the on the level of training or on the topic of training, um, I say this all the time. You can take everything else that we do in the fire department and outsource it except mm -hmm. firefighting yet it receives the least amount of actual practical realistic training of everything that we do in the vast majority of fire departments now i know there's anomalies i know there are departments out there that put a premium on structural firefighting but i can tell you in the Thank vast God. majority of american fire departments we do we, we spend more time doing EMS training and hazmat training and dive training and USAR training and inspections and you fucking name or excuse me, freaking name it. <laughs> There's a, but you, you literally, I mean, we spent all this time, pardon my French, but, but we, we spent all this time doing mm -hmm. stuff that, that is, is it important? Yes. Mm -hmm. But we could outsource every bit of that tomorrow. You, you could literally tur turn around and say, you know, we're not going to do EMS anymore. And another private EMS company will come in tomorrow and take it. You could say we're not doing building inspections tomorrow. Hire civilian inspectors. They'll come in and do it. You could literally outsource everything. Hazmat, use are you name it. There's people mm -hmm. doing everything else but firefighting. Mm -hmm. And somehow we just seem to fail to get it that this is, our, you know, at our core of who we are when mm -hmm. people call 911. They expect professional firefighters to show up and know what they're looking at, what to do to fix the problem, and then to be competent and capable to be able to implement tactics and strategies to actually get it done. And, 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 man, and I, you, dude, you got me fired up because I, I, I really, I truly believe that, you know, you I'm talk sorry. about thermal imaging. That's just one, you know, it's one component of our job as firefighters, right? And a lot of it one. is people don't know what they don't know. And, and there's a lot of, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of dumbing down of the fire side of what we do. And you talk about like PPE, you talk about thermal imagers, you talk about, you know, mm -hmm. everything from the tools we use to force doors to the nozzles and hose. There's so much information out there that's mm -hmm. really, I mean, if you want it, you can find it. I mean, people are teaching this stuff. It's, it's, it's out there in text, but people don't want to take the time. So what they do is take, they take anecdotal stuff that gets passed down from one guy to the next guy. They don't challenge the status quo. They don't challenge the information. Mm -hmm. They don't go out there and actually, like you said, validate. You know, we want to be professional firefighters when we're going for a tax raise or when we want mm -hmm. the citizens support, but then we don't want to put the legwork in to actually understand our craft, to understand, you know, mm -hmm. fire behavior, building construction, proper tactics and strategies, you know, what's mm -hmm. actually going on inside our fire pump and our hose and our nozzles and all the things that we do, right? We want to be mm -hmm. professionals, but we don't want to put out the effort. And I hate to say that. And a part of it is I think we're, we're spread so thin that guys just, you know, oh, I learned that stuff in fire academy. And that's where it stops. Or, or mm -hmm. hey, you know, we already know how to do that. But do you really? I mean, do you, you know one way of getting it done, but is it the best way? Are you constantly mm -hmm. challenging yourself to be better? And that's, I think what it comes down to is like, we just do a really good job of checking boxes for ISO. Mm -hmm. right and and, and making mm -hmm. sure the nfpa and everybody else is happy and we're covering our mm -hmm. bases and we give a lot of lip service mm -hmm. to, to firefighting but we don't really back it up with our actions we don't really back it up 
with where we spend the vast majority of our time and effort. And, and mm-hmm. to me, like I said, man, that's, you're, you're spot on. And, and, you know, when you talk about thermal imaging, um, I can tell you when, you know, personal experience coming on the job where guys are like, press the screen button, turn it on and point, and it'll tell you how hot that, you know, that X, Y, Z object is. And that's literally yeah. what I was told coming on the job. Yeah, and, we, and, and so yeah. like, there's a lot of people don't know what they don't know. They don't even know all the components, you know, what they're looking at, all these different modes on your, when you start talking to people, the vast majority of people, you know, field of view and you know, they have no idea what you're talking about. They have zero context for what you're talking about because no one's ever explained it to them unless they've been fortunate enough to stumble on an article from, you know, guys like yourself or, or a class where guys are actually mm-hmm. teaching this stuff. Um, even in, you know, high class, you go to trainings, how many times do we emphasize thermal imaging use? And I'm, I'm, spe- I'm speaking to myself here. Now, how many times are we putting thermal imagers in people's hands when they're doing you know, engine work, you know, training on going to live fire and they're going to go extinguish the fire or, or, you know, doing search and things Mm -hmm. like that. You know, there's, there's, it's out there, but we just throw it in people's hands and say, here, here's a tick and expect them to know what they're looking at. And, you know, that's, that's a problem. That's a huge problem because we don't even know what we're looking at most of the time as as the American fire service, the general population American firefighter just knows, turn this button on, point it at itself, it's hot. Amen. And I see the videos where you see whether it's training videos or Hollywood videos doesn't help us because people are, you know, running with the camera in front of them. They're scanning high instead of starting low. There's all kinds of things you see that you go, why are they doing that? Because no one's told them, sure. You know, that it's going to cause issues. But I think what you, what you just said is spot on, but it boils down to the following words. We look good on paper, but we don't look good when it comes down to actual practice. Yeah. Meet all, meet all the papers, but, you know, what formal training do you have that requires you to do X, Y, Z? And then if you look at, God bless the training academies, you look at their schedule and say, how are we going to fit another thing in? Because they have all this stuff they have to do. And then well, you want this, but where do we put it? Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's a struggle for many departments, too. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, if people really looked at it, they'd realize that the device that I'm passionate about in, reinforces fundamentals and it's a force mm-hmm. multiplier. It's not designed to replace you or Sean is designed to help you see the objective, hmm. then go do the objective. You know, it doesn't, it's not a magic wand. It has many flaws and issues and other mm-hmm. things outside of what it can't do. But I mean, if you pull out uh, your driveway, you're going to look both ways before you cross the street. I'm asking people to do a size up and look at the front door as a minimum to see where the problem is, what get their life fire and layout. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, cause I hear life fire and layout and then I see them sticking in their head and zero visibility. <laughs> with a flashlight and I'm going, yeah. let me put this in terms we can all understand. Both, both of you have families, right? Yeah. Okay. So think of it right now. Both of you are at, at a conference somewhere, which is highly probable. You're away from your home and the fire department responds to your house and your family's trapped. Are you good with them going in in zero visibility and feeling their way around to get to your family? Are they, are you better with them doing a size up, looking in the front door and says fires left bedrooms, right? Y'all take care of that. We're going straight to these bedrooms because we know there's people home, you know, they use the data, you know, from firefighter rescue survey that shows where people are, where they're found. Mm -hmm. We use data, we use statistics, we use our training, we use our knowledge and the device gives us just the road. You know, you put the camera down, you check conditions and then the other things, life, fire and layout. And then they shove it in the, they point the camera up first. I say this all the time. I said, if you come crawling across the ceiling, I'm not going in your fire. Okay. You got bigger problems. Okay. <laughs> I'm starting down low where people are found. Yeah. I mean, if, if the even changed recently, they're telling people start the scan low. There's a reason for that. Victims are found down there and the tick performs better in what lower temperatures. If I shove it up and the camera goes to low sensitivity or low gain, most cameras lose discernible detail four foot down and you lose those things that you were trying to find. And then if they don't know to do the certain behaviors like wiping the lens and periodically doing that, they're just carrying an overpriced flashlight or paperweight at that point. So we need to fix all of these issues with knowledge and education and training, not condemn anybody for it. Because as my, as my dad said, son, 15 years ago, you didn't notice either. So I'm not going to talk down to anybody. But I think the fire service needs to start reaching out to people who do this for a living, thermologists, thermographers, people who work in industry and say, what works in this scenario, right? 
what technology to use, what are the contraindications, you know, yeah, NFPA does have one standard, 1408, that says you have to have training, but we did a survey with Firehouse Magazine and 40% of the American fire service didn't even know that standard exists, but they know who ISO is, right? To your yeah. point. So, yeah. But that's that. But bottom line is, if we're going to, if it's going to be important, when does it become important in the fire service? What makes it important for us? Name a reason why. Name one. My family. Sure. I mean, yeah. that's a pretty good one. People. Like come home. Yeah. Okay, but you know? your fire department, what makes your fire department change? Not you, not your behavior. What makes your organization change the way they do business? Name a major reason. Line of duty death. Line of duty death, consensus standard change, and anything that has to money. do with government funding <laughs> and money. Money. Yeah. So when we, ki- when we kill somebody, a standard changes. When we have major issues, we get sued. Right. Stand our standards change when the fire department says, oh, we're going to provide a new service. And this service requires this many people or this much equipment. You know, they when they when they go to the state and they say they're going to be EMTs, do they tell them, oh, well, we're not going to do that much training because that's too much. The medical medical director of the control board tells them you will do this training. Mm-hmm. But everything else, every state can can diminish the amount of fire training that they require. There's some that require next to nothing. Yeah. You're going. I'll put it to you in terms you both can appreciate. Would you go to a doctor or surgeon tomorrow and he's going to operate on either one of your kids and he has had one to three hours of training on that particular device he's going to use on your kid in surgery. Yeah. And, by, and by the way, he watched a video. About it. <laughs> yeah. And I don't yeah. know anybody that would, would uh, tolerate that. But you're going to go in a burning building and risk your life and potentially the public's on a device you just now got and may have received zero training on because the email from the fire chief said it's been placed on the fire truck. Please check it out. Yeah. I've seen emails yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, and that, that's kind of another problem. I feel uh, personally that's plaguing us is, um, you know, nothing against these people, but our, our sales reps that are coming into our firehouses with this equipment, they don't really know what they're supposed to know. They just show up and say, this is how it works. Turn it on. They sell a bunch of stuff like time and time again, um, they have been unable to answer questions that are important questions to know. Uh, they don't really know much about that camera, but we just purchased it and it's on the truck. And, and like you said, Andy, it goes, Hey, it's on the truck. Make yourself familiar. Well, what am I going to familiarize myself with? I'm gonna, the, the yeah. friggin' instruction manual that it came with. Like that's, that's, that's all it. I know. Right. Mm-hmm. So that kind of brings me to the other side of this. Um, and this is, this is going to be long winded for you. I know it is. <laughs> um, Sorry. It's important <laughs> that we know, right? Like how our cameras work and what those yeah. components are and, and what, what temperatures things start to happen, low sensitivity, high sensitivity. It's important that we know the difference mm-hmm. between a situational decision-making camera or a situational camera and a decision-making camera, right? Like those are two different things. And mm-hmm. the vast majority of us have no clue, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you'll you'll see cameras on rigs that are like, Hey, that's, that's not even, you know, what are you going to do with that? Right? The resolution's so low, you're not going to pick much up or they legit think that the integrated thermal imager in their pack is good enough. Like that's going to yep. magically fix everything. So there's a, there's a large gap of information missing when we purchase equipment and then tell our firefighters to use it. It's, it's a big problem. It's, it's actually a lot worse than you think. I had a department call me and said, Hey, we're having problems with our thermal imaging cameras. Um, FLIR is not helping us out. You know, they all failed. Can you help us out? And I was like, what do you mean they all failed? Well, we took them in the fire and they all quit and they're not honoring it. I said, well, what kind of camera did you buy? Because, you know, I just want to know. I'm clarifying questions. I'm not assuming anything. And he said, we bought a TG165. And I went, I don't get stumped that easily, but I went, I got to get back to you on that. So, you know, I start Googling and reading. And if you pull up a FLIR K1 and you pull up a FLIR TG165, they look almost identical. One is a situational awareness camera and one is an automotive inspection camera. Same housing. One's $200 cheaper. What do you think they did? Yeah, they saved money. Yeah. They bought five of the automotive inspection cameras that are not designed to go in a fire. They took them in a fire and they've all failed. Yeah. Because they thought the tick was a tick. Where I grew up, gentlemen, 
a tick was something that stuck on your leg when you come out of the woods after playing with your neighbors. <laughs> a, a thermal imaging camera, there's thousands of models. Now, I'm not talking about just fire service stuff. I'm talking about all kinds. And we don't even know the two main types that you're talking about, Sean, like situational awareness versus decision making. And by the way, that was forced upon us. There was decision making cameras, and then all of a sudden, yeah, 2015, 2016, oof, here comes a litany of these cheaper, smaller ones, right? And that's where the salesmanship side of things got, got really dicey because that stuff got pushed for price point without talking about performance. And people were telling them, oh, you can do the same thing with these. One of those situational awareness cameras you just mentioned says in the instruction manual, you can use this for thermography. Yeah. And I challenged the manufacturer. I said, you really want to assume that liability? They said, what do you mean? So you're telling people you can use this to inspect buildings, check electrical panels, we mean well thermography is the study or measurement of objects without touching a remote contact measurement and all of those thermography means you have quantitative or qualitative there's exact measurements and there's quality you didn't define anything you just said thermography well thermography is basically you know measuring heat what what are you doing with that device you really want to do that so the manufacturers are just throwing things in there they're having someone else make it throw it on there put a lot of bells and whistles that you don't need right you know, lots of unnecessary color palettes that are not designed for fires. And firefighters are, they're like sitting there, oh, look, it'll do this and it'll do that. And if I'm multi-press and long press and push this button, are you kidding me? How much time do you have to push buttons when you get off the truck and somebody's screaming, my kid's in the back bedroom? You don't. Yeah. I'm trying to get them, I'm trying to get them to turn it on and carry it. That's the two biggest issues I have. Turn the device on before you get to the call because they realize it takes a long time for some of the cheaper ones to turn on, and then carry it. Honestly, that's my biggest objective to start with. And then, okay, now you're carrying it, maybe you'll use it, these ways mm -hmm. we tell you. But then if they're using, like you said, Sean, they're using a situational awareness camera and using it improperly, those are those were designed to prevent firefighter disorientation, really. But then they're also used to make lots of money, because if you think about it, there's 1.1, 1.2 million firefighters it's only 30,000 fire departments, approximately 33,000, whatever it is. And if only if every fire department buys a handful of decision making cameras, that's not a bunch of money. But every firefighter buys a situational awareness camera. Well, that's a different ball game. And especially if they're like cell phones, you got to upgrade them every couple of years. It's continual profit, right? And they're good in their intended context. But when you start using them outside of it and getting mad because well, we used that camera. It was terrible. It, it lags. It freezes all the time. It's like, which camera? Oh, it's this model with a nine hertz refresh rate. Oh, really? <laughs> you know what that means? You know, yeah, no, that's, they, that's, they don't. that's it. No, they don't. They, Let they, me, they think it's a tick is a tick, right? Yeah. So. No, that's that. You're, you're dead. You're dead on, man. Um, if we can, I, I'd like to just take a few minutes here, Andy, and, and I want to go over some of the stuff you've been talking about the last few minutes, you've used some, some lingo that maybe folks uh, are not familiar with that are listening to the show. So uh, let's start with, uh, you know, we talked about uh, earlier on field of the field of view when we're looking through a, a thermal imaging camera. So can you kind of describe when, when people hear field of view? So I, I just happened to pull up the, uh, you know, the, the FLIR K65 uh, spec sheet and, and I, I'm looking down the sheet and I see, you know, it's got a, you know, field of 30 view. Uh, 51. Yep. Yep. 38 by 51. What is, what does that mean? Okay. Well, let's, let's first start with what we all understand our eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm looking at something, your eyes see something vertically and horizontally. That's how the field of view is measured in cameras and in eyesight. So your eyes sees approximately 60 degrees vertically by 170 degrees left to right. That's pretty impressive. Think about it. But you can almost see 180 degrees. All right. Now, let's put a face piece on. What happened to that peripheral vision? What happened to your corners? Right. You lose Average that. face piece between 100 and 120 degrees. So you just lost 60, right? Somewhere in there, 50 to 60. Now, let's put a thermal imaging camera in front of our face that is 38 by 51. You went from 60 to 38 and yeah. you went from 170 to 51. Is there a good chance if you stare at that? device and don't scan with your eyes first and then with the tip and do it properly that you are going to get tunnel vision and miss something yeah oh, huge yeah. 
And like the picture behind me here, the camera's turned sideways for a reason. Because Carrollton Fire Department in Texas, in a PowerPoint I found in 1999, said you can increase the field of view of a pistol grip camera by turning it sideways. Why can you do that? Because a cell phone, whether I hold it this way, it's in landscape mode. If I hold it this way, it's in portrait mode. The camera auto-orients based on how you hold it. Mm -hmm. So you can take a better picture, right? Fire service ticks don't do that. They're oriented based on the, the pixels of the, or the detector itself. So if it's 38 by 51, typically you have a 320 pixels wide by 240 pixels tall, depending on how they have it set up. Mm -hmm. But you, when you turn it sideways, if it's 38 by 51, now I have 51 degrees mm -hmm. instead of 38. So the two areas of firefighters most concerned with when they make entry to a building would be what's on the floor. You know, our victims are found four feet down typically. And then the heat above me. Sure. Well, if I turn the camera sideways, I can see the floor and the ceiling in one view in a residential context. As long as it's not a faulted ceiling above nine or 10 feet. You know, I'm going to have to adjust my scan. And here's the cool thing about holding it sideways. If you just twist your grip like you're holding a motorcycle throttle, mm -hmm. you can actually angle it up or angle it down. You don't have to swing it around like an orchestra conductor. So I, so I can sure. start left away from the fire, which I like to do, because mm -hmm. I found if I look straight where I think the fire is and I see heat, I don't look at anything else. I get tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. So I start, look, I look with my eyes, sweep the floor, check for victims, do what we're supposed to do, live fire and layout, use my flashlight if necessary, and then take your thermal imaging camera and read conditions starting down low on my left wall and working across towards where I think the fire is. And then I finish my scan across the ceiling to make sure I'm not crawling in the unidirectional flow path. That takes half the time as a six-sided scan. But that's the field of view is defined as the observable world within, within the lens capacity of the camera itself. Sure. Based on what you just said, 38 by 51. Sure. So you, if you want a really cool example of this, do two things for me when you go back to the fire station. A, Sean's seen us do this. Have somebody lay in the floor and hold your camera straight out like you're standing up, hold it in a pistol grip, and then gently rotate it sideways. We'll pick the victim up in the floor because most firefighters are not getting down like they're supposed to. We tell everybody to get down, but mm -hmm. we don't. Right. The other demonstration you can do is take traffic cones and set them out in your parking lot and set them at 15 feet apart, 30 feet apart, 40 feet apart. And if you really want to get their attention at the wide ones, put a little baby doll on one. And I want you to stand at 15 feet and hold the camera out and tell me how many traffic cones you see and back up. Try to play with the angle, see how much you see. Because the closer you get, the more narrow it is, the further back you see. But that's just inside good conditions. You start getting inside of a fire with optical, basically dense smoke, moisture, and all that. That affects the ability of the camera to pick that up. So your field of view is the first attribute we talk about anything because it's how the camera sees and how you see. And that's the two most important parts is if I can't see and then my I get tunnel vision and I stare at the camera too much, I can literally, we've got testimonies of firefighters come in, drop one knee, go to gangster grip. A victim was three feet to their right and they never saw him and went straight on red conditions, went high, red right, went right to the fire and found the victim during overhaul. Yeah. That's terrible. Yeah, it's bad. But that's an end user behavior that can be fixed with training mm -hmm. by teaching them to go fundamentals first. That's why we say it's a force multiplier. So if my skill set is zero, 10 times zero is still zero. You know, I have to work on my basics before I add the tick into it. And that, sure. that's why field of view is important because you've got to know how you see and how the camera sees mm -hmm. and how that changes based on stress and your behavior. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, that's, I think people don't really understand, like you are limited. It's a tool, right? It's got limitations. And, and mm -hmm. like you said, you know, when you take your field of view all the way down to sort of having all this peripheral vision is down here, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be a little more methodical with how you use that tool and make sure that you're covering all the spaces that you need to be scanning. And uh, you also mentioned resolution, right? So uh, you get out there and you start looking for cameras and obviously there's, Few different uh, resolutions you'll you'll find in the market. Uh, I know that the, the flares that we were using, uh, the three twenty by two forty, seems to be a pretty common resolution. But can you kind of get a little more in depth and break down what what we're looking at as far as resolution and and you know, you talked about the the one sixty by one twenty being kind of archaic, but it's still on the market. Mm -hmm. um, it is. What what would you consider? I mean, what is a higher end resolution for the fire service? Obviously, one sixty by one twenty is 
pretty old. And then, you know, and then when we're looking at just, you know, tactical decision making cameras versus a situational awareness on my air pack, or is there a difference mm -hmm. in resolution as far as what we're seeing? Um, and just kind of break that down a little bit for us. So, you know, people listening, like I said, you know, have a lot of questions on this stuff. And, and I know that, uh, you know, learning this stuff for me was like a mind, you know, my mind was blown when I realized, well, like I said, a tick's not, a, you know, every tick's not the same. There's differences in what you can and can't see and make out. Um, and so when you're teaching resolution to people, uh, what are some things, the high points that you try to kind of hit with them to understand when they're purchasing a tick or, or using a tick that they have, you know, as far as limitations go on that, that camera, uh, what are some high points that you try to hit with them uh, on that particular topic? All right, let's start with the situational awareness and do let's start with something we can all understand. Mm -hmm. You've been instructed by your spouse to buy a new TV for your home. You are in the local store and you're looking at TVs and both TVs you're looking at claim the exact same resolution side by side. This one on the left is $200 cheaper. This one on the right is $200 more. Well known, talks about 4K, all this stuff. You buy said cheaper one. You get home, and when the sun's shining through the window, you can't see the darn TV. But this other one had brighter pixels, better clarity. You could stand at an angle, but we went cheap, right? So the problem with the fire service is buying a $500 to $1,000 device and expecting it to perform like a $5,000 device, right? That's the first problem. You don't buy a cheap thing and expect it. You don't, you don't buy a junker car from the junkyard and expect it to perform like a Ferrari. That's the first problem. And situational awareness cameras typically are lower resolution, lower refresh rate, could be nine hertz, which will hurt you. You're talking about three to five second lag when the camera sees heat. You could lose 40, 50 feet in that time when that camera's trying to catch up. So the whole purpose of that camera is defeated when they threw a nine hertz refresh rate in there because of the wonderful law called ITAR, International Trades and Arms Regulations and Export Arms Regulations Law, which basically says anything above nine hertz cannot be shipped out of the U.S. and Canada without a lot of paperwork. If you want to know why, look around the world around us with all the terrorism we have. Basically, this stuff's military grade. They don't want a bad guy with a 30 to 60 hertz infrared detector being able to track your family. So the easy way around it for the manufacturers to make a nine hertz one, they can ship it anywhere in the world and make more money. So there's your first problem. You give them so, a situational awareness real quick, Andy. small screen. Yeah. Got a just real quick question. Um, so when you're talking yeah. about refresh rates, obviously it's you know, resolution and refresh rates kind of go hand in hand working together. But you talk about refresh rates, meaning you know, how fast the camera can pick up each frame, right? As you're moving. That's so, right. Frame rate. The technical so, term is frame rate, yes. Okay. So so you know, what would be like, you know, our, our eyes are obviously like cameras, right? We work at a certain pace, right? Uh, we're able to take information in at a certain rate. What is what is a typical human eye able to pick up? 27 hertz. Okay. So, so you're, so you're buying a camera that's three, three times slower than your God-given eyesight. Is that a good idea? Seems a little counterintuitive. Honestly. Seems like a bad idea until <laughs> people are explained. As long as I'm holding that camera still right. and I'm sitting in a day right. room, they're impressed. And then they start using it in high heat environments and realize, oh, this camera has a digital camera on top of the thermal camera and my digital camera went away when I went to fire. And then when I scanned and it saw heat, it took five seconds for the camera to switch or the camera's freezing every so often because of the nine hertz refresh rate. Well, and obviously so that, that, that impacts your operations. If you're missing, you, you could miss a victim in theory because you're scanning too fast, correct? And frustrated firefighters lead to firefighters who don't use the camera anymore because they get sure. tired of it. So we've, we've created some little hacks to help them with that. On certain devices, we've mm. learned how to use software to change some of that. But bottom line, a situational awareness camera typically has a smaller screen. It's not as well insulated, lower resolution, harder to see. It's not going to give you your, you know, DLP 4K picture that you see on that TV that you should have mm. bought, right? So first, start stop expecting high-quality performance out of cheap devices. Don't get mad at the device. You, you were the one that bought it. You know, a situational awareness camera should be close to you, like you can look at something five to seven feet away and figure out, is that a hose line? Is that a doorway? Is that my crew? Is that my way out? Regain orientation. It's a plan B. Okay. Plan A was to stay oriented. But plan B is when you read about all these people that didn't and things, bad things happen. That's the first one. When you talk about resolution in general, 
The reason why you said 320 by 240, that's the minimum standard per NFPA. And then if you look at the way the military does it, they use a three-letter acronym called DETECT, RECOGNIZE, AND IDENTIFY. Can I detect the object with the camera first? Something's out there. Sure, we can pick it up. Can you recognize what it is? It's a person. Great. The military would say, well, that's a person with a 50 caliber rifle pointing at me. Well, that's even more important to know. So when you want, you want more pixels on target. And if we put this in firefighter terms that makes it important, I like to say this. If you want to be a subject matter expert, make the subject matter. You're talking about resolution. Let's put it this way. Your kid in a floor down a hallway, 25 feet in a smoke filled environment. And you have a 160 by 120 camera. The best you can see is seven feet. Is that a good enough for your kid? No. Now stay low, get a 320 by 240 camera that's got all kinds of software enhancements that makes the picture better. And not only do you see them at the end of the hallway, you see the thermal conditions, you see a secondary means of egress, and you see the mom that tried to get to said kid that you would have missed with the cheaper cam. And because the refresh rate's faster, you didn't miss either one of them. And you put the camera down and you go get the victim and you take them out away from the heat, like that search study we just read talks about you should do. This is when resolution pays off. It's not a high resolution TV that we watch the Super Bowl on. This is your Super Bowl for somebody's life. And if I'm thinking about making differences in people's lives, the difference is in the details. Just like you getting the wrong address and pulling up at the wrong spot and the house is across the street or somewhere you got to make a U-turn and go around and delay your response. That's, that's costing them time. Second, seconds equal life or death. Resolution, more pixels on target equal better for firefighters to make better decisions, but they have to be tactically trained to slow down because you see them doing this orchestra conductor or what somebody said in the last class we talked, he said, I see, see, he was swinging that tick around like a lightsaber. I'm like, good luck. So resolution is important, but do you know to slow down, pick mm -hmm. up the information, or as Chief Lightly says, stay, stay low, show, go. You know, tell them go right, but I think that's the part that's missing. Is and I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this question if I have a Honda V6 engine from 1992 and you got a Honda EX 2023 model twin turbo V6, both of them are V6 engines, are they not? Sure, which one's going to perform better? You're going to knock my, you're going to blow my doors off. One of those Hondas just got clocked doing 137 miles an hour and outrunning a police officer recently. So, yeah, there's a big difference in a 320 by 240 detector from 13 years ago and one today because they add a lot of things to it. And it's down to software, image enhancement, programming, the screen. There's a lot of things they're doing that are outside of just infrared. And until you, gentlemen, hear me when I say this, until you take the camera in a fire, and see what it'll do in low heat, medium heat, and high heat, you're not gonna know. Sure. So if you don't take it in fire and test it, shame on you, because you're gonna find out the hard way. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, and I know my recent fire, um, I won't get into particular cameras and everything like that, but having the camera we had definitely made a difference for us. You know, we, we were in a commercial building, we had a hard time fighting the fire, but you know, if you knew what that camera was telling you, it matters, right? It matters in all the decisions that you're going to make. And, uh, you know, it played a huge role in us backing out of that building. And guess Good. what? The, uh, the, the roof collapsed. So imagine if we weren't training with that, right? As a fire service, we don't know what our cameras are capable of. We don't know what they're telling us. And we're just saying, ooh, look at all the pretty colors. The fire must be right here. <laughs> and nobody on that crew was able to be like, hey, this is bad. This is really bad. We need to go. Hey, man, we like crayons. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, hey, like, hey, 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 I'm an engine guy. Don't, don't make fun of crayons. <laughs> my, my point being is. Blue is my favorite flavor. The fact that the officer. <laughs> I'm going to quote you on that. Blue is my favorite flavor. I, I That's good. It. That was a good way to, to tone this down a little bit. Sean, <laughs> Sean's about to get in something personally powerful. And you're talking about blue crayons. Only friends would do this to you, Sean. Uh, you know, <laughs> Go ahead, man. Back, we'll, tell we'll tell us your term. story. I'm going to mute Nick for you. Go. <laughs> we'll use the term friend loosely here. Um, <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> my point being is the officer was the one in charge of, of that fire and he had the camera. And, um, you know, I'm a firm believer in the officer having the camera. Um, I know some people aren't. But in this particular situation, he knew exactly what he was looking at. Right. And we were able to determine, like, this is not a good spot for us to be. Right. We need to leave. Had he not known that, had he not had training on that camera and, and used all of his senses and everything else and slowed things down to, to gather all that intel that we're getting from what he's seeing, that situation could have been very different. You know, so I, I urge everybody to know what your camera is telling you. Not all cameras are equal. Color scales are different per manufacturers, things like that. Like just where I'm going with that, Andy, is. I want you to expand upon that and talk about how, you know, people are confused. They think our thermal imagers are thermometers and they're not right. They look at that DTM at the bottom of the screen and they, they assume that's what the temperature is and they don't know how to read scale. They don't know how to read any of that stuff. So um, I want you to talk a little bit about DTM, um, direct temper measurement, and then also about the modes, high sensitivity, uh, what occurs in that low sensitivity, what occurs in that, and just kind of give people an understanding that when things change on our camera, we need to pay attention. Well, let, let's, let's start with what you first started with, which is colors. We'll start with that and we'll get to the spot temperature one because this will grand culmination will end with that one. So we'll go, we'll go colors, temperature modes and direct temperature measurement or known as the spot temperatures, they say. So first of all, red doesn't always mean super hot. So let's let's pick three examples and say your department, Nick's department, and another department all show up at a multi-alarm fire. And you have three different thermal engine cameras operating inside. And Nick's department uses XYZ brand, so I'm not going to name brand. You use ABC brand, I use one, two, three. XYZ brand shows color in low sensitivity at 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. And most of them are not paying attention to the green triangle that showed up in the upper left hand corner to begin with. So just like your eyes, when you go from dilated to constricted, there's a change. If you study your eyes, the change is actually known as a chemical change of low sensitivity. Did you know that? So when your eyes change due to light, your camera changes due to heat. Certain cameras show color only in low sensitivity. Certain show in high and low. Do you know when yours does? I challenge you to look that up to start with. So, so if Nick's shows color in high sensitivity at 270 degrees Fahrenheit, and then when it switches, it doesn't show color again until 1,000 degrees. If he's waiting on color, what's going to happen to him? He's going to get killed, injured, whatever. It's bad, right? He's going to be unaware of changing conditions, which we read about in a lot of duty death reports. Firefighters don't pay attention to gray, fast-moving convection currents, which is bad. Where is that? High, medium, low, is it a full exhaust? If I'm crawling in a full exhaust, I challenge you to read about some line of duty death reports where all the firefighters were in a full exhaust and none of them came home, okay? So understanding your camera, when it shows color and why is critical, first of all. So, and know that that's known as an apparent temperature. An apparent temperature is an uncompensated temperature measurement. It's a qualitative device. It does not measure temperatures accurately. Straight out of the box, these cameras are off, plus or minus five degrees to as much as 41 degrees in a 72 degree warehouse calibrated on a perfect black body object. Is that the area you work in? No. What happens when you're further away than the calibration? You're in a smoke filled environment with high moisture content or the wind's blowing. Is it gonna be accurate? No. What about if I'm pointing at a shiny surface? It can be several hundred degrees off, okay? Several hundred. I can send you an emissivity chart, which is the single most important attribute in temperature measurement, which fire service ticks should not be used to measure temperature. They measure heat, heat, heat loss coming off the surface. So you said direct temperature measurement. That is for quantitative thermal imaging cameras only. The fire service copied that, put that number in there, and despite manufacturers' recommendations not to use that in a fire, it was cited in numerous line of duty deaths in the NFPA 2021 standard or NFPA 1801 2021 standard. They removed the spot temperature from the startup feature of TI Basin because firefighters kept reading that number. I've seen firefighters read that number in overhaul and they come out and say, hey, chief, 
live, we're good. The living room 72 degrees. I'm like, let's just take a walk and go inside. And the simplest way to fix this gentleman is, is training with small heat sources first. So we call it little box, big box. We use the max fire box first, and then we take them in a fire second. So we show them outside where they can talk and hear everything. Then we take them inside. Because, you know, when you put your mask on, it's like, are you sure the professor cards coming across the field? No, I have no idea what you said, but man, that looks cool, right? So I fix it where we can talk and see it, and then we move into the big box, right? Because my voice, as my wife says, my voice is low, I mumble, and I put people to sleep if I talk like I really want to. So we got we to gotta clearly explain it and make sure they understand. So color temperature correlation is only as good as the person understanding when that shows up. Spot temperature measurement should not be used in fire whatsoever. One of the largest departments called me in the middle of COVID and asked if they could use their bullet T3Xs to check their firefighter's forehead for fever. I kid you not. And I bit my tongue and took a deep breath and said, they don't know. Explain it to them, right? It's not a quantitative eleva elevated body temperature screening device. Those devices are very sensitive and programmed specifically for that use. Let's put it this way, gentlemen. If you want an exact measurement, A, you have an industrial camera. B, you have to go through a thermography class to do this. You would know, need to know how far away you're standing from the target. You would need to know the exact emissivity of the surface. You would need to know the reflected apparent temperature of the surface. You'd need to know the ambient temperature of the room. You would need to know the transmissivity between you and the target. What is that? And you would also need to know if your camera's in focus and in the proper range called, it's called forward, focus range and distance. You would program all that in and get an exact measurement depending on your camera, plus or minus half a degree Fahrenheit. You don't have time to do that, nor should you. You want a high resolution, fast refresh rate, low thermal sensitivity camera that performs well, simple and easy to interpret, doesn't lag and gives you good data when you need it and allows you to give good information to your firefighters so they can do their job. Not it's 72 degrees at the ceiling. I could care less. If you give me an exact number, I'm going to take a Walmart smiley face sticker and put it over that thing in the corner. We chief likely talk, man, we teach, we put our thumb over it so they don't even see it. Because they, they're, it's like candle moth syndrome. They're drawn to it, right? So that's the first problem is firefighters say, oh, I use that all the time. It's a thermometer. No, it's not. You go back to the station, I need y'all to do the following for me. If you want a more fun experience, you need a metal trash can. If you want a boring experience, you need a bowl, you need a shiny pot and boil some water in it. Take some electric tape, put it on the shiny pot, boil some water when you're cooking potatoes or pasta. Standard staple in the firehouse. When that water is actively boiling, stand back about five feet and read the spot temperature measurement on the side of the shiny portion of the pot and tell me what it is. And it's going to be close to the ambient temperature of the room. And then ask anyone looking through that camera, would you put your bare hand on that metal? And they're going to say no. But what you said, the camera's thermometer. Then move the spot temperature over to the electric tape and watch it skyrocket. Why? Because the electric tape is the same emissivity of what the camera's calibrated at, which is around 0 0.95, 0 0.97. If you want to know why they chose that number, is that's carbonaceous objects, human skin, soot, wood, things that are rough. There's a lot of things that are made of that. And they absorb or emit heat really well. If it's closer to zero emissivity, it's considered low E. Where have you heard that word before, the phrase? When you had to go to the home improvement store and you saw the windows, it said low E glass, which means it reflects energy more than it emits or absorbs. So if you look down a hallway and you've got a stainless steel refrigerator and a fire right next to it, you may see a reflection of the fire off of that. But that's not an accurate measurement, nor should you be reading the spot temperature. We teach people to you know, differentiate between heat sources and reflections. Most of them tell you to wave at it. Well, you can wave at the fire all you want. I'm on a nozzle and I'm going to put water on both. And if it goes away and comes back, it's a fire. If it laughs at me and does nothing, it's a reflection, okay? That's my litmus test. Water tells me which way I need to go. I can force a rebound down a hallway. Kyle Romagus, I quote you. Thermal rebound, love it. If I understand it, I can use it. But that comes back to fire behavior and fundamentals and the, using the device to do that. So color temperature correlation is only as good as the person using it and knowing your camera and your neighbor's camera may be different. Spot temperatures are useless in fire attack and should be removed per NFPA. They finally agreed to that. And then when you look at the camera itself, it has to adjust to the overall level of heat 
depending on where you're pointing. Sean, you and Nick could push down a hallway and keep the camera pointed at the floor. And the majority of the time, you could keep it in what's known as high sensitivity, which means high sensitivity to detail, like your pupils are dilated. That doesn't mean you're in a cool environment, does it? No. So your camera adjusts to heat at a certain percentage point, depending on your camera. So you said FLIR, for example. Your camera, when you see 2% of what's in front of you, over 302 degrees for one second of pixel saturation, the camera freezes, a green triangle inside of a box shows up in the upper left-hand corner, and then you see color. That's called low sensitivity when that triangle shows up. Per NFPA, if it has a low sensitivity, it shall have that indicator. And the majority of newer cameras have that. The only one that doesn't have a low sensitivity indicator is Seek Thermal's products because they use mixed gain mode. They have 76,800 freelancers. Each pixel is doing its own thing. It's like Chief Lightly said. It's like junior high. Everybody's doing their own thing. And it switches on its own. There's no symbol to worry about. Okay? But if you don't teach them the difference between high and low sensitivity, they are going to miss something. They're going to miss the fire. They're going to miss a victim. And they're going to misinterpret the entire environment. Because your camera switching at 2% is pretty sensitive. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. Well, absolutely. 2%, let's say 2% of 300 degrees, that's around 1,800 pixels. You and Sean are about to do a search, and you guys are jam up, so you're all going to split search. You come through the door, Nick's going to the fire and closing the door, and Sean's boogieing down the hallway to the bedrooms. Good plan? Okay. So, what happens when Nick throws the camera in gangster grip and he's on his knee down low? And the triangle engages two foot off the floor. Where are you? I'm in a bad spot. Well, not for you. You know, they say you UTEC says an ordinary temperature level for us is 392 degrees. UL study says that's ordinary. That's something firefighters can endure. Can a human victim endure 100, 392 degrees? You know more about temperatures and victim survivability than anybody, Sean. That's not good for a person. So if I don't have water, sooner Nick can close that door and isolate the fire, the better, because then I'm taking away that from them, right? But the two things I should think about is, is it easier to remove the victim from the problem or the problem from the victim? Nick closes the door, Sean drags the victim out, boom, game over. But which way, which, which way is more tenable, which one has less heat? All that's required on Sean and Nick knowing what that camera says, diagnosing their plan, their path, and which way I go with the victim away from the danger. If it hurts you to come down the hallway, you don't drag the victim down that hallway, right? But high and low sensitivity tells you that. And that's how the camera adjusts for it. So if you look at the key attributes as a whole, you just maybe cover almost every one of them. Field of view, and I know y'all know this because y'all are corrupted, so you can cheat. Uh, temperature modes versus application modes, resolution and color palettes, those two go hand in hand because you know what color you're seeing and how well it's seeing it. And then the final two are distance to spot ratio, which is where your spot temperature comes in, how it's calibrated. And then emissivity, which is basically it measures the surface of things. It doesn't measure gas temperature, smoke temperatures, or anything accurately. It does, it's not x-ray vision, okay? And it doesn't have a windshield wiper on the front of the lens. Your dirty fire glove is what you do to wipe it, right? So that's your overview of the key attributes of how that camera interprets that, that environment. But that's only as good as the person holding it if they know what that means. Yeah, well, well said, man. Um, so I want to go back to, you know, I open, I go to the fire room door, right? And I have my thermal imager and I, you know, 300 degrees at two foot off the floor. And let's just say there's a victim right inside that door, right there next to the fire room. Uh, and this is something that where I'm going with this is thermal contrast, right? So we do this all the time. We train in cold smoke environments or in the engine bay or whatever. And we get used to seeing victims that are bright, right? They're, they're brighter than everything around them because the human body in that situation is warmer than the environment. But, you know, and, and this is something that I've had to kind of recondition my mind, you know, in training is understanding that as it, it kind of inverts, right? You have this thermal inversion where now the environment is the worst thing, right? The fire room. And the victim's not going to be bright white. They're going to be probably a dark silhouette, right? Um, I want to just talk about that for a minute because I think like we, we almost train ourselves to fail, right? We go in these cold environments all the time and we get used to seeing the victims are a certain color on the color palette, right? You know, bright white or gray or whatever. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that as far as, you know, how, first of all, 
your thoughts on, on on training our minds to to look for victims in a higher heat environment, right? Um, you know, as far as things you do, maybe drills that you teach to get people to understand what they're looking at, and then you know, just the, just when we're talking about the the environment itself, you know, is there a point where we can completely miss victims because the, the temperatures are equalized enough where where there's no definition of the victim themselves? 99% of the time, you're not going to see the victim with a thermal imaging camera. Why? What are they going to wear? What are they, or where are they going to be? You know, you can't control those variables. You sure. can't control if they're alive or dead. They're in the fire room, in the hallway, 12, you know, six feet from the door. You know, are they behind a door? If they're behind a door in a, in a, in a cooler room, they're all going to present differently. So we teach it simply this. Background temperature, body temperature, and the camera itself. Hmm. So the background temperature determines how the camera is going to perform and also how the victim is going to look. So, I, I mean, I do this a simple drill with your camera you mentioned earlier. I take my hand, I hold it over here on the countertop, and I bring my hand over in front of the, the three burners on the gas grill, and my hand disappears. My hand didn't change temperature. Some firefighter instructors will tell you it's thermal inversion. Uh, thermographers don't believe in thermal inversion. It didn't yeah. change the temperature. It changed the appearance sure. of its temperature, right? My hand's still there, and I'm not going to leave it over the burner very long. But what if what if they're dead, and they've been dead a while? What is your body no longer doing? Produce heat. Your largest organ is what? Skin. Yeah. It regulates what? Temperature. Temperature. So if it's not regulating temperature anymore, there's three types of emitters when you study infrared. There's active, passive, and direct. You are now a passive emitter, which means you're a sponge. So you act like your turnout gear. Your turnout gear works by absorbing and releasing heat. Most of them absorb, 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 and don't release very well. Your skin's just going to start absorbing heat. You could blend in. Parts of you may stand out. What if you're covered with a bunch of blankets? It's not going to matter. What if you're hidden behind a door and you were hiding? You're hiding behind a glass shower door. You're not going to see them. You know, they talk about if you lean up against the shower door, you might see them, might not. There's all kind of variables that can come into play. But what you said in the beginning is true. We train more impressionable firefighters to fail at identifying the victim than we do to actually rescue them. So if you look at some of the rescue videos that I have, mm -hmm. the victim is gray or blends in or there's one where they're three feet from them and the victim's leg is dark. It's right there. And they didn't recognize it. So, you know, hands on the victim, hands on the room. The camera doesn't replace a scan or, or the camera doesn't replace a search. Right. We, we scan the room. Then we send somebody in to verify. I can't see through a couch or underneath a bed or behind a door. It gives me the layout. And then, you know, like firefighter rescue survey tells me, you know, they may be found between the bed, the window, and the door. I'm, I got a little triangle I'm going to work, right? At least I know which direction I'm going. And I know I don't I don't need to tell him any more than that. Show him, hey, it's a crib. Go here, right? It's a bed. Go there. But when you talk about training to fail, we're training people to fail when they identify victims. Because, they don't, A, they're not wiping the lens again with they're standing up. And they don't know the difference between high and low sensitivity and how a victim's going to appear either or. Mm -hmm. And then, B... How is the victim going to appear based on the environment? If it's 200 plus degrees apparent temperatures in that room and Sean's laying in the floor, if he's alive, he's going to show up dark depending on the camera. But you're not going to know until you train with it. You can take an infant mannequin and soak it in a cooler with ice and it's going to show up dark, right? But as that infant mannequin sits in that heat, it's going to dissipate and warm up and blend in with the background just like a person. Yeah. Would. But if you heat that mannequin up and use cold smoke, you're training an impressionable firefighter to recognize a white hot victim. It's not always the case. It sure. depends. And it really should depend on getting that layout and then identifying that area and then putting hands on it. I think if we're honest, the tick's not going to identify the victim as much as it is the path and our performance to get to that where they might be. You know, we don't see victims that much with the tick because of conditions mm -hmm. and because of those things we just mentioned. You know, most of those cameras you talk about where you see people really well are single gain, high dollar cameras that are very dialed in. They're not for fire service use. They're called search and rescue cameras. You're talking about a camera that has to has to work in low heat, mid, middle heat, high heat. And as it as the heat increases, guess what 
decreases clarity in many cases. So the higher the, the heat conditions in the room, what are you going to, what you're not going to see down low details, right? Details matter. So train them right to begin with and give them the layout of the room so they can search it properly. So they can do it faster and train them to recognize conditions behind them, closed doors, give them secondary means of egress. If they locate a victim, guard be thinking, am I going out that window versus going down that hallway? You know, all of those things matter, right? But yes, I agree with you. We are training them to fail if we continue to use fake smoke and sell heated mannequins and say that's a solution. Yeah. That's an engineer who doesn't work for the fire department and doesn't understand the context of where you and Sean and I work. Well, yeah, they want to sell the silver bullet, you know, oh, you just use this. It's a, you know, end all be all and you'll, you know, save victims and all stuff. And, and the thing is, it's a, it's a fantastic tool, but I think really just kind of emphasizing again, understanding what you're looking at, understanding the tool that's in your hands and, and making good decisions, using it to enhance those decisions, but not taking the place of you physically actually doing your job. Yeah, no, that, you, that's key. That's 100% correct, you know, and uh, I, I can attest to that, everything that Andy just said. Um, you know, a couple years ago, we had a we had a fire, it was like 11 o'clock at night, and the first two crew was going to force the door. So they forced the door, and they took, a, they took a quick look with the thermal imager, saw an anomaly, did not look like a person, right? Just a shape, something was different. Um, masked up, dropped the camera, went straight to to that spot and found out it was a person and they were able to drag her out to the front yard. Moral of the story is one, they didn't waste any time, right? They scanned real quick with the camera, recognized, Hey, that's not right. That's a, that's something different, but they weren't training their minds to necessarily look for a person. They were trying to look for the fire, right? So in that sweep that they had, when you talk to the crew, what you'll find out is that um, they were kind of taken by surprise, right? Um, but they had the know-how to realize like this, something's different here. And they'll tell you the same thing. No training they ever had prepared them, right? That that was going to be their reality when that showed up on the camera, right? We're training everybody to think that we're going to see this thing like a giant outline, like, oh, there they are, go get them. And that's just not reality. No, and I agree with you. I think there, I think there are enhancements coming to our world that will help us find victims better, but that's not that's not happening right now not well i mean there's edge detection and lots of things that are out there but it's not fully developed kind of like when they first put the the tick inside the mask great concept but they haven't really developed as well as they should so when we get better detection capabilities we can do that but in the end nothing's going to replace boots on the ground people inside searching but the camera should be used to aid you to get to that location faster give guidance and get out that's what it should be used for. Oh, and absolutely. If we, get, if we get really good, as Thomas and them talks about in my group, we're split searching. You know, when they come in and, and they they're clearing rooms in the military, they're not they're not three of them in one room. There's one going this door, one going this door. They got a triangle, and they're they're coming in. They all got night vision. They all have their assignments, right? Right. So eventually, eventually, we're going to get to the point where we're going to clear we're going to clear buildings like they do, but not now. I mean, we can't even get people to carry the darn thing and upgrade their technology. I, I quote Chief Lightly again. He has a, we have a slide where it has a Nokia cell phone. He says, I challenge you to take this simple little Nokia cell phone and get on Facebook and check your email. And, uh, you know, is it sound absurd? Yeah. Well, so is using a 1999 or 2001 camera or a cheap situational awareness camera and inspection, inspecting it to perform like a 2023 higher dollar model that has all the enhancements that they have. Now. I, as you said in the beginning, Nick, they don't know what they don't know. And I honestly believe one of the reasons why we're successful is one, A is good Lord, but B, we carry a lot of cameras when we go play. So my van right now, I got 26 cameras in there. So I put different cameras side by side and they take their camera and they go, they take their old camera and they put it next to a new camera, whatever brand it is. And they're immediately impressed, right? Because they haven't seen that before. They haven't seen the thermal layer that close. There's certain cameras that have image enhancement that when I have fire, it outlines stuff behind the fire. The old rule in thermal imaging was if you had flames, you couldn't see through flames. Well, software enhancement is outlining the door behind the mattress fire where the kid's hiding in the bathroom. 
That's important to know. Or the hole in the floor, right? Things that, or in in the what I consider the most important things, you scan a great room and you see a big long dining room table and you see three high chairs and a wheelchair. Are those people going to be upstairs? Maybe, maybe not, but you know you have four non-ambulatory patients. That's important information for you to know. You didn't know that when you pulled in the driveway, you saw cars, you knew people were home, but you know what kind of people, people who can't get out on their own. Right? This is the kind of information we're trying to instill is more information for better tactical decision making. We call it intelligently aggressive. I yeah. scan the room and say it's a living room is one thing, but it's a living room with that type of information. My fire is to the left. Sean's isolated the fire. The fire attack crew suppressing the fire. We're pushing down the hallway, making these bedrooms. Or if it's a two-story house, we start talking about greatest thermal threat. Where is the greatest thermal threat if the fire's downstairs and the kids are upstairs? Upstairs, because yeah. where is the heat, the smoke, and gas is going, right? So this is fundamentals, gentlemen. And all we're doing is giving you the ability to execute the fundamentals faster. Does the citizen not deserve that? Then we need to quit arguing about nozzles and ticks and, you know, which one's better and be better ourselves and educate ourselves so that whatever brand camera your department has, we can help you with it. If you need to upgrade, yeah, we'll help you with that too. But let's start with what you have. It's like, you know, I I didn't like a three-piece Halligan, but I had a three-piece Halligan. I didn't like an MSA 5000. I had an MSA 5000 for 15 years. I had to learn to use it. Right. Let's learn what we have and then help our department be better. But learning for people to recognize victims, I think it's more about let's get the layout, let's get the fire conditions so we can get to where we know the victims are based on that data, based on that information. And then the stuff you teach, Sean, and stuff you teach too, as well as Nick, putting the fire out faster, getting in there and, and locating the victim and how you drag them. You know, that search study, that, there's a battalion chief in that video. He says, just because we arrive doesn't mean they survive. I thought that's brilliant. Because how many times in your training, since you mentioned training to fail, do your does you, did your department or mine make you go the longest way possible to meet the objective and then the longest way back to get out? When you find a victim and they're three yeah. foot from a window and in your mind you're going, there's the window. But in the back of your mind, there's that training officer yell at me that I should go back the way I came. Yeah. And to turn my flashlights off because I'm cheating. What are we doing? You know, we're creating a basically a, an environment for people to fail. We're not training people for success if we're doing that. So to answer your question, how do we make more realistic training is give them realistic data, give them realistic information and let them execute it in the way that their department allows them to for two person, three person crew and help them enhance that at their level. And then let them get better and get better and get better to the point that I don't, I got to get out of their way. You empower them and get out of their way. But I think we got to quit being afraid of enhancements and technology and all that. Cause I read an article from a chief Bobby Halton, God rest his soul. He posted something a while back where firefighters were arguing about new motorized engine companies that they wanted to keep the horses. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, we're fighting. We were arguing over that back then yeah so you know so imagine what we argue about now you know what alan brunicini say the two things we hate change and the way things are yeah yeah and we gotta be we gotta quit being afraid of that i like chief coy's thing we need to honor tradition and lead change for the sake of the people we swore to protect and that's that's the bottom line yeah it can't be about ego it's about them so yeah absolutely man that's i well said (laughs) it's uh it's kind of crazy that you know it's 2023 and the stuff we argue about and and you know fight over in the fire service and you know make a it's it's crazy that we are still trying to get people to wear their ppe to use the tools at their disposal to understand what's on just the basic stuff right we're not even talking complex stuff um but it 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 is <laughs> we we are our own worst enemy sometimes as a fire service um in a lot of ways but uh real quick uh shifting gears uh just just for a few moments here i wanted to kind of branch into uh, a little bit of fire behavior slash tactical operational stuff uh you're a company officer obviously um and so i want to talk about uh you know when you're using the thermal imager for operational stuff i.e 
let's talk about uh, external size up, uh, whether it's, you know, doing your 360, uh, sizing up a roof for ventilation, si sizing up your search, you know, where you're going to target your search um, and, and what you're looking for, some of the things that you're looking for. And then shift gears, kind of hit that and then kind of shift into, if we can, the internal size ups, i.e., you know, your flow pass, things like that. Uh, fire behavior inside when you're taking a hose line to the see the fire or you're searching for victims inside. Um, and what are some of the, the key points that you're looking for? So if you, you know, you pull up on scene, let's just kind of take it from the start. You pull on scene and you, and you get out to do your 360. Uh, what are some things that you're looking for as you make your lap around the building uh, with the, with the tick? What are some things that you're kind of trying to clue in on? Obviously you're using all your senses. You're trying to use your eyes, ears and everything else, but using that specific tool. Uh, and then as you kind of, are getting ready to go into operation mode on the interior. Uh, are there things that you're kind of trying to pick up on that maybe you can use the tick for that you can't just see your naked, you know, see with the naked eye or, or, you know, we talk about guys like waiting until they're hot to be like, Oh, we need to get, you know, we need to get out of here. Well, obviously having the ticks, a huge advantage if we know how to use it, right. We go in, we can see flow pass. We can see convection currents. We can see things that are, Hey, this is probably not getting <laughs> going the way we want it to go. Right. Um, so let's let's just kind of you know you pull up what are some things on the outside and as you transition to the inside, uh, what where does your mind go as far as using the tick? We kind of talked about it as the life fire layout initially when you make the door, but beyond that, as you're making your way down that hallway to that fire room or or searching that that house, uh, what are the things you're looking at? So uh, go for it, man. I just I you know that's my mind is wrapped around you know we we kind of talked to the technical side of the tick and and why it's important, but. I want to just take a few minutes and hone in on the the operational stuff of actually using the tick and how we can use that to enhance our operations uh, in the various things that we do on the fire ground. Okay, so let's let's think about outside the fire service for a second. If you are a building inspector and you're what they call a building scientist, where you you go and inspect buildings that are already built, they're having problems. They got uh, the building's not efficient. They're leaking air. Their their power bill's too high. They got a moisture leak somewhere. These people come in and use industrial cameras to identify a problem. And they produce a detailed report of where air is leaking, infiltration, exfiltration, moisture intrusions, lack of insulation. All of that through using handhelds and drones to produce those images and then they interpret it properly. In order for them to do so, they need only a 20 degree temperature differential on average between the interior of the building and the exterior to get enough contrast to see the problem. Would you both agree that if your house is on fire, that there's going to be more than a 20 degree temperature difference from the inside to the outside, no matter what the building is, whether it's a type five masonry, cinder block, well insulated, whatever, mm. it's hotter inside than it is outside. And I am going to have what's known as a Delta T, a temperature differential enough that my camera may detect subtle anomalies and some not so subtle that will help me pick that up. Would you both agree on that? All right, so the first problem is that we're not even carrying it during size up. So we get off the truck, we give a beautiful size up on the radio, and we start our 360, and the tick's either hanging from our coat or still in the charger. That's an issue. So size the building up with your eyes, your training, your experience, and all that first. And then we tell them to take the camera and we scan from the bottom to the top. It's the same thing we do inside. We start low and go high. We changed our outside scanning because of human behavior. Firefighters would look up, they would see heat, and guess what they'd never do? Look down. What if I got smoke pushing from the third floor of a 1900s colonial? Would that be a balloon frame with fire in the basement? Yeah. Right? And I'm focused, I'm, I'm candle moth. I'm focused on the chimney. I'm not focused on the source of the fire. So we start our scans low, middle, and high, and then we teach them to look at areas where heat could be transferred. If it's an older home that wasn't well insulated to start with, I'm liable to see heat transfer pretty well. I'm looking at a building that's super well insulated. I might have to look for small, subtle fumes. But what we teach is a concept called thermal bridging. Engineers hate that. Basically, you're trying to stop your energy from your home leaving this room and going out the window because you pay good money for your power bill, right? So you want to stop that. So the way you stop that is you insulate it, and every door, opening, or hole in your house is sealed with something. And usually it's sealed with something that's flammable, and fails under fire conditions. Think about your windows and your doors. Whether Nick, if you live in a new house and I live in an old house, we both have a $4 rubber gasket around our door. And that thing burns away really quickly, melts off. Then I see these weird non-uniform wispy patterns around the top of my door. 
And then I see the same thing around windows. And you go, well, you can't see through glass. You can't see through anything. What you need to understand is what you're looking at. Am I looking at single pane glass from the early 1900s that doesn't stop infrared energy to go through? Because then I might pick up even more heat. Am I looking at double pane windows with argon gas in it? That's all I'm going to see is the heat signatures around the edges of the window or the argon gas might heat up and produce this weird cloudy effect because that's what window thermographers do. They look for an uneven pattern of where the argon gas has leaked out and they know those windows are bad. We're learning from industry and applying that building science to the fire. I look at the bottom, I look at crawl spaces, I look at uh, dryer vents, I look at doors, windows, anywhere they poked a hole in your house is sealed. And then I look at areas that you have normal for ventilation, soffits, gable vents. I look at the roof line, anywhere things come together and touch, that's a place for heat transfer. Well, what if it's touched with metal, a dryer vent's metal? Does metal transfer heat really fast? Yeah. So both of you live where it's cold, do you not? Okay. Yes. So you appreciate you. You will appreciate the following: if you don't have good insulation in either one of your houses, you're not going to be able to forge your power bill during the winter, right? So yeah. when you go to the Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, wherever you go, the insulation says R something, R13, R40, R80, and the higher that number, the more expensive it is because it resistance to heat loss. So what if I'm looking at something that has a terrible resistance to heat loss? such as metal siding, metal metal roofing, a metal box, such as you ever seen shipping uh, shipping containers and how they transfer heat really good in the fire when you're training? Think about all these storage facilities, metal garages, metal buildings, shops, backsides of restaurants. Because people tell me all the time, well, you can't teach size open shipping containers because that's not the way the world is. Have you driven around your first due and looked at the varying construction that you have? You need to think about the envelope and the infrastructure, the anatomy and the physiology of the building. What holds it up and how is that energy going to be transferred from the inside to the outside? If you find the weakest link in how that's done and the best person to learn that from, his name is Christopher Naum, by the way, buildingsonfire.com. The man is brilliant. He's a 40 plus year firefighter and a 40 plus year architect. He understands it better than anybody. And he can tell you how the building is going to burn down. He walks you around your town and shows you that. So if you understand building construction and fire behavior, and then you scan the building properly, guess what you can find? Where the fire is, where it's going, how severe it is. And now, gentlemen, am I the only center in the room that has stretched a hose line to the wrong place before? Oh, this guy yeah. has. Oh, yeah. I have. I have. I well, have. now I can I can take <laughs> the line in to towards the fire instead of away from the fire, right? And I can start that interior size up you talked about. I've heard people say, you know, 360 takes too long. We got to get in there. I got a, a binder over here with people who are no longer here, including my own department, of line of duty desk where we failed to do a 60 to 90 second investment because it takes too long. Yeah. And they're dead. They're dead. Chief Mitchum, one of my mentors, said, take seconds, save minutes or more. So if Sean's doing his 360, you can stretch your line to the front door with the irons. And if you have a situational awareness camera and he has a decision-making camera, you can cool the door, force the door, because we cool doors. We don't water flowers in my in our training. Everybody else checks their pattern, flows of water on the grass. We put it on the door and the porch because when we open the door, we want the fire to meet moisture so we can gain that time to do that life fire and layout. We check behind the door and around there with our eyes and our flashlights first. And then I can use that little situational awareness camera to look that five to seven feet and see if somebody's there. And I might see heat at the back of the house. You come back around, Sean, and say, yeah, I got a fire on the seaside. And you're like, yeah, I saw that. And Sean goes, yeah, but it's burning through the basement floor. Yeah, that's important. We're going to take the hose line around the back, go through the basement door and put it out. We're not going to go down the chimney, right? So that's that initial size of it and that entry point. When you get there, we teach a concept that my father invented called go, no, go decision making. It doesn't mean never go. It means identify these variables on where you're going to attack the fire and why. So if you study all of our stuff, our gear hates anything above 500 degrees. And people are like, oh, no, I got flashover protection for how many seconds? Ask them, ask them what their TPP rating of their gear is. Ask them if it's brand new, out of the bag, washed and perfectly clean and ready to go. And then ask them if it has, or is it full of sweat from you running fire alarms all day? 
And then I ask them, have they cooled the environment adequately as they're making the push? Because if they, if they say any no's to all that, then you don't have whatever the manufacturer tells you you have. So Sean has a 42 on his TPP. That means he has 21 seconds of protection until he receives a second degree burn and flashover temperatures. You really have 21 seconds when your face piece melts off between 350 and 600? No, you don't. No, you don't. Uh, yeah, that's that's well, it's the weak, yeah, weakest link, right? I mean, what's what's going to fail first? And well, NFPA yeah. 1971 says your gear shall not melt, ignite, drip, or separate up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So you shouldn't let it go past 500 for you, right? But Sean, Sean knows you shouldn't let it go above 200 for the victim. Yep. And I'm not saying it's the thermometer, but if I scan that room and I see 500 at the ceiling, you can argue about, hey, down here, survivable space all you want. But if you if you lay a, a London broil underneath a broiler, the London broil is not saying, hey, it's cooler down here. It's cooking. OK, right. so, yeah, it may be cooler down there, but radiation goes for its exponential to temperature double. So if the temperature doubles, radiation is exponentially four times as powerful. So if it's 100 degrees and it goes 200, then you got to the fourth power of radiation coming down on whoever's down below. It. That's the contents and that person. So if you see a descending thermal layer, if you see uh, temperatures above 500 degrees, you see fast moving convection currents, you better deal with it or it will deal with you. It'll deal with the victim and deal with the property because I hear this all the time. I didn't open the nozzle because it wasn't that hot. According to whom? Yeah. Right. What if you crawl past three couches? on the way to the fire room and your thermal imaging camera records, say you use that FLIR you're talking about, and I put it in search and rescue mode, which is a game changer. And it highlights color beginning at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And th all those couches show up at 200 degrees, which are yellow, which means those couch cushions are doing what? Off gassing. Off gassing, yep. I say this all the time. At Christmas time, we tell people to water their tree, but nobody wants to water that couch and that couch is far more dangerous. OK, and then that victim in the floor is breathing those superheated gases between 185 and 212 is killing. Why are we not cooling that environment? You see that you mitigate it. We teach people to see the heat, not feel the heat is my point. And then they use that as a diagnostic tool. And as, as Kyle Romagas says, I'm going to kill that compartment. I'm not going to kill that victim. Yeah. I can wash them out in the front yard. I can't survive the alternative of those increasing temperatures. The exponential amount of gases, hydrogen, hydrogen cyanide, carbon monoxide, and all the other stuff that comes with it, it's not getting any better because now we're putting e-scooters in the hallway and spray foam insulation and lightweight drywall in our walls. We're putting more gasoline and glue and synthetics in our home than we have ever before. And then you want to slow down. You don't get to slow down. It's already past you. Right. So all of that intuitive, that, that exterior size up leads to an interior size up, which tells you where the fire is, where you start your search, where you place your line. And more importantly, watching conditions, because if you read line of duty death reports, one of the things they keep saying is they were unaware of changing conditions. Sean and Nick, why would I be unaware of changing conditions in zero visibility environment? What would prevent me from knowing things are changing? Thermal imager. No, what would prevent me? Prevent? Not the thermal, yeah, Not, what would prevent me? Yeah. Flowing water. Not using your stuff would, I mean, if you're not using it, you're not going to know. What gear are you wearing, Nick? What brand? We got the Globe. GX Extreme? Yeah. You can walk through Satan's living room before you feel pain with that on. What are you wearing, Sean? Uh, morning Pride, I think. Okay. Depending on the spec, you may have the same because they make them in different specs, right? Oh, yeah. So if your gear is super high TPP and you were taught not to flow water, and you push down that hallway and all of a sudden you hear it on the radio, which is one of Don Abbott's 25 things that contribute to a May Day. It's also listening to Line of Duty Desk. You hear, unable to find a fire encountering high heat. What does that tell you they're crawling in? A flow path. Yeah, they got, yeah, yeah. they've got themselves caught. And, and what's happening to their gear? If they're feeling heat, what has their gear already done? Saturated. Saturated. What's going to happen next? They're either going to be burned or the environment's going to light. It's going to light at the vent point, which is at the door or the window behind them, or somebody's taking a window because we're scared of the dark. We're not, gentlemen, we are not making the fire go away. We make it worse, and then we put it out. We go in, we can't find it. We take windows, it finds us, it lights off. 
and it's like intercourse fire like in now in now when everybody's against transitional attack no i mean take care of the problem on the way to it wildland firefighters have a statement they say we get in trouble we retreat to the black why do they retreat to the black area in a wildland situation what can't hurt them? yeah they can't get burned it's already burned so if you and sean soak that living room and there's two inches of water on the floor and the fuel is all wet is that fire going to overcome all that moisture really easily? No. This is you're like Gandalf. You throw your, your staff in and say, "You shall not pass. You ain't coming past me, right?" And then I'm owning this space. I'm owning this next space, and I'm controlling it as I go. And that doesn't happen uh, slow, and it doesn't happen fast. It's smooth. It's intentional, and the speed is based on your skill set, not the camera. But that size up is how you get to the fire faster and how Sean does his search faster. And we're asking you basically five to eight seconds of scanning time at the entry point of each space to save you minutes of wandering around in the dark and fumbling instead of going right to the target and the objective. Is that not worth the investment? That's my question. Yeah, no, 100 Yeah, that's, you know, honestly, man, I, you know, it's funny. You talk about going to stretch the line to the wrong place, right? Um, or, or, you know, getting in a situation where you're like, hey, we can't find the fire. Um, mm -hmm. We had a fire a couple of years ago, uh, three-story house. And first engine truck get there. They go in doing their thing. We get there. Uh, third due. Somehow we ended up being assigned writ uh, initially. Um, but anyway, long story short, uh, <laughs> instead of just standing in the yard, just hanging out like, oh, this sucks. We're like, hey, let's be proactive. Let's go do a, a lap around the building. And we're listening to the radio traffic from the first engine and truck, and they're saying, hey, we're having a hard time finding the fire. I'm like, well, that's not good. You know, they're on Division Three; They can't find the fire. There's a bunch of smoke. Uh, and so we're walking around uh, and doing our – just kind of doing a size up. And using the thermal imager, I happened to notice some heat signature on the second floor around the window on this back bedroom on the Charlie side. I'm like, hmm. So I take my flashlight and shine it up there, and sure enough, you can see the windows black as can be. And just mm. starting to crack just a little bit. And and mm. upon further inspection, smoke is starting to wisp out of the siding. Mm. And so we radio back to command and let them know, hey, I think your fire's on Charlie's side, Division 2. Uh, <laughs> kind of gave them the synopsis real quick of what we had. And sure enough, 30 seconds later, here comes the line. You can see it, you know, hear the line hitting the fire and stuff's getting better. And, you know, but it's just one of those things where they went where, uh, where they thought the fire was based on how much smoke there was on the third floor. And in mist, it was actually on the second floor burning and then burning up in through the uh, wall there. And and just kind of, you know, it's one of those things where uh, had we not had the thermal imager, though, and not been proactive in, in, in the red assignment. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not tooting our, our horn, but just saying, no. you know, taking those those things that we had learned. And it's funny because uh, uh, Joey DeVito had just done a class up in mm -hmm. Fort Walton uh, right like right at that same time. And it was just so funny to, to have that experience because it was like, you know, here we are, learn all this stuff and go put it to use. And like two weeks later, we're, you know, we're using it and it's like, it's actually, it, it's, it's working. And it's, and it's, it's just kind of a testament to not knowing what you don't know. Well, then it's like, Hey, that's a good idea. Start using the thermal imager doing 360. And sure enough, we got a fire and got to use it and it actually made a difference uh, mm -hmm. just from size of standpoint. And so, you know, for anybody out there listening, I mean, they, these are useful tools, but you have to get them off the truck. You got to turn them on. You got to use them. You got to train with them um, mm -hmm. operationally. Like if we're not doing those size ups, we're going to miss important clues. They could help us. Like you said, take a few seconds to save minutes. In, in this case, like I said, had they done that, you know, maybe they go right to the fire. It gets, get, it gets put out before we even do a lap. You know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, in this case, I mean, it, nobody was hurt or, you know, or anything like that, mm -hmm. but, but that fire absolutely could have been, a, a you know, if someone's in that building and we're mm -hmm. on the wrong floor. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a bad situation for them, obviously. So uh, absolutely, I, I think it's it's one of those things. It's a no brainer. If you have this piece of equipment, understand what it what it's telling you and, and use it operationally. It's not just something we talk about. It's great. You can know all this technical information. But if you don't put it into practice and don't mm -hmm. actually use it in your day to day operations, then you're missing the whole point. Absolutely. And I think that's our problem is we're negligent in using all of the things we have in order to help the citizen because of either. We don't like it, we lack of training, fear of it, whatever it may be. But Joe DeVito also has a great statement. He says, if your tick changes modes, so should your tactics. So when I told you when you got down on one knee and your, and your camera engaged, you need to engage. 
and do something about it, right? Uh, and knowing when that occurs is a big deal. If you're outside and you know that search and rescue mode on your FLIR can see color earlier and size up, you need to be using that. If I use that camera, I always start in search and rescue mode. Earlier or late is what Mike Chapman taught me. Because that I'm farther away from the fire. I want to see the heat signature early so I can find it. And that would help you in that size up feature. The other thing we haven't talked about is there's cameras that have application modes like yours that are more single gain or special features that allow you to find lower temperatures that most people just dismiss. Well, if it's a six inch wall, a 200 degree temperature signature is not going to show up in color in the majority of the cameras out there. And you're going to miss it because whether you believe it or not, the movies lied to you. There's more than 50 shades of gray and under stress, you're going to miss the 242nd shade of gray because your camera uses 255 of them. And the human eye can see 30 shades of gray and that's an average female average male can see 10. And if you're both under stress, you can see four. So early colorization of a threat or a problem is beneficial to you. So if you're using search and rescue mode in the FLIR, that's great. If you're using a Bullard, you can use electronic thermal throttle if you're good with that. There's uh, the old Scott X380s had a hot spots, cold spot tracker. That was a great benefit. You're not making that camera anymore. Cold spot tracker. Sean, from a RIP perspective, if you're down, it's going to go straight to your bottle on that cold spot tracker. Because you're breathing, your bottle's dark. Hoarding conditions. Ryan Pennington's the best about that. You have a, a pathway that's going to show up dark. A hole in the floor that doesn't have fire behind it's going to show up dark. Knowing these extra features, if your camera has them and when to use them, is beneficial, especially when you're, you're hearing stuff like that. Oh, we can't find a fire. You should be throwing some red flags in your head if you're incident commander or you're RIT. You need to be really paying attention because there's enough data that shows that's when we make mistakes. That's when we get hurt. That's when we die. And we need to be paying attention because all of these classes, that whether it's reading smoke or incident safety officer, they teach you to read the building. They teach you to read the smoke. They don't teach you to read the heat and the heat signatures, which is what thermologists do. They interpret that heat and what's it mean, where is it at, where it's going. If you see a heat signature on the outside of the building that's severe, on average, it's double on the inside. So what does that tell you if you see a three? If your camera switches to low sensitivity, on your FLIR from the outside, 20 feet away, looking at a vinyl sided building with smoke pushing, what you got inside? Bad. Right? Over hot. 300 degrees. That's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit uh, toasty in there. Mongo open nozzle, right? So yep. we're going down the hallway, we're flowing and moving. We're not squirt, squirt, don't work. Okay. So th this is giving you more information to do your job. If you did the size up, did the initial look, and the camera failed after that, I guarantee you still. You want to find the fire faster and you're still going to do your search better because at least you have a plan, a layout. You have data that reinforces what you need to do. And that's all we're trying to get people to do. I'm not asking them to be a level two thermographer or, or go into the internal components of the camera and understand the detector, the amplifier, and the display. You want to get into that? Great. We'll geek out about it. But I want to give you what's known as experientially relevant information. You're a blue collar profession with master's degree requirements. And it's no longer acceptable to be overly skilled and grossly undereducated, period. It is not yeah. acceptable. I, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of hearing, oh, we're, we're skilled. We're skilled. Well, God bless you. I want skilled people, but I want skilled, knowledgeable people who can think for themselves. If they push down that hallway and they see something wrong. They know what to do instead of, I'm skilled. I'm checking the box. This is what I do. I always do this. No, always and never should be thrown out except for always be a good firefighter, always be a good husband, be a good dad, right? So we want people who can think, critically thinking, skilled firefighters. I don't want just textbook firefighters and I don't want just tactically sound. I want a blend of the both. And people don't like it when I say that. They're like, oh, well, you know, textbooks and degrees mean nothing. Sure. If they don't have any understanding and experience behind it, it's got to be a healthy blend yeah. of the two. You cannot afford to be in this profession and not be in the books and then be out there. You got to be out there on, on the pavement, moving hose and searching buildings and doing all that. You got to do both. And me as a chief officer, I have to do it because guess what? I don't get to do when I go to work. They won't even let me wash dishes. You think they're going to let me touch a hose line? Why do you think I own a training company? Ask Thomas or any of my boys, yeah. who's the first one to pick up a nozzle when we do fire attack? Me. Why? Because I don't get to do it at work. 
So yeah. I'm going to use it, right? So stay on these skills because they're like milk and eggs. They'll go bad if you don't use them. Okay, that's my, my summation. So. Yeah, I taught so much stuff there to unpack. I, I hope our listeners are, are going to get as much out of this today as, as I know I have too. Yeah. And um, the one thing that I just want to to point out is we, we talked a lot about um, fire and, and victims and things like that, which is all great stuff. I love it. But I, I want to tell people too, that like, let's not just think that that's, that's where the only use for this camera is, you know? Um, I mean, there's so many uses, so many incidents that we run, uh, probably daily across the country where a thermal imaging camera could greatly help us, you know, traffic accidents being one of them, you know, you want to know if someone was in the car recently, point that camera at the seat, you'll see, you know, uh, there's just, to me, the, the amount of uses that we can use it, whether it be hazmat or utilities or, you know, whatever that situation in, there's probably a use on your incident that that camera comes in handy. Um, so, just get think outside the box, use it, understand how to use it, you know, and, and apply it to your situation. Just make yourself better. You're going to be, you're going to find yourself more successful if you do. Sean, on that note, I have a simple PDF document I share with people on a regular basis. It's called utilities and other hazards. So if you think about all the other stuff you run from storms to power lines down to car accidents, whatever, it shows some different applications of that because everybody's been taught. They've been taught more about what they can't do than what they can do. Right. right. I, I was taught thermal engine camera can't see gases. And that is true. But if I have a very cold gas leaking out of something onto a surface, what does it do to the surface? It cools it. So I got a picture of a two inch gas line, three foot underground, making a beautiful V pattern where the cable company's orange pipes coming out because that 58 degree gas is cooling that hundred degree dirt on a summer day. And I'm like, there's where the leak is. I don't know where the gas plume is. I don't have percentages in the LEL and all that stuff that we use for the meters. But at least I know where my target hazard is, right? Right. You know, I've got I've got down power lines that weren't visible to the naked eye in daylight. They were laying up against the curb and they light up of 7,200 volts. You got fluid levels on natural gas tanks. Some tanks are insulated, some are not. You can see things. Sometimes you can't. You know, we've got all kinds of stuff. That stuff you said about motor vehicle accidents. You got a car with the windows busted out. Nobody's in the car and you look in there and you see two car seats in the back. What's going to make you feel better is when you scan and see one heat signature on that driver's seat versus two heat signatures in those car seats, right? I'm still right. going to search the car and check around there for the kids, but it makes me feel better that I know I'm looking for one victim instead of three potentially. Uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things you can use it for. I've got St. George fire protection district. One of my guys, they got a picture of a gas uh, line to a water heater that's lit up 900 to 1200 degrees because during a storm the neighbor was using a generator back fed power to the next house that neighbor called 911 and said my hot water is so hot it's burning me when it comes out of the faucet and the firefighter yeah. just happened to look at the hot water heater and went um that's a gas water line it's metal it shouldn't be that hot we had an open neutral it back fed through the house and was energizing that hot water heater so just just look. That's all we're asking. Look, and you never know what you're going to see. And you don't want to. You don't want to do this. I'm going to touch it to see how hot it is. That's my that's my favorite. I'm going right. to use my ear. I'm going to use my ears, or I'm going to take my glove off and stick my hand in the smoke. So you're going to let your kid walk towards a hot stove, and they're going hot, hot. You're going, Go ahead, touch it, Junior. Tell me how hot it is. <laughs> you, you know, do you know what our workers comp department would do? to a firefighter who took their glove off and stuck it up in a thousand degree flow path to check temperature. They would deny it and send this terrible letter to the training department, our fire chief. Why are you telling people to take off their city issued safety equipment that will protect them in a fire so they can measure temperature with a human body? Yeah. Okay. Your body quits measuring temperature at 140 degrees. The good Lord turns off your pain receptors, dumps endorphins in your body, fight or flight to get you away from it. So at what point do you realize maybe I should understand how the human body works, how the building works, and then use the tick to give me the diagnostics so I do my job. That's Absolutely. education and training, right? All that data you've amassed, Sean, that's awesome data. But if you can't get down that hallway and drag that victim, it's just data. So that's you it. do both. You do both. 
And that's the key. Both of those together, whether we're doing it on a car wreck or you're you're uh, upstairs on that third floor when the fire is beneath you and Nick, you found the fire, you save their life, whether you know it or not. So just keep doing that and stay skilled, stay active. My neighbor's kids are stealing my mail right now. <laughs> yeah, he is, he is. I'm, I got him on camera. He's, he's at he's at the front door. He's in my mailbox and he's he's going through my mail. He's like, is there anything good in there? What's in there? What's in there? I'm watching him. He's, he doesn't know I see him. But my wife and my wife and daughter are gone. He put it back, but he's like, I don't see any toys. Oh, <laughs> I got cameras everywhere. <laughs> oh man! Well, on that note, um, are you ready for some questions? Fire away. <laughs> we'll, we'll close this out. Rapid we'll, fire. We'll get you Let's back to your day. Let's hear about it. All right, Nick, go to ahead. See what these are. All right. So, question number one: Rapid fire. What is your favorite job on the fire ground? My favorite job is being the second person back on the on the line. Everybody's like wants to be on a nozzle. I don't want to, I want to be the second person back because they can't move the line without me and I want to watch out for them. I've been on the nozzle. Yeah. I want I want the young people to be in there and I want them to get as much experience, but I want to be the person looking for that stuff we talked about and helping them move line. I actually like loading corners and managing pinch points knowing that that helped them get to the, get to the fire. And then I know how to direct them from 20 feet away. Sure. Nine o'clock to three o'clock over your head, flow water. Right. Yeah. He gets that. I don't have to show him the tick. You know, he's passing you open a nozzle. Right. Yeah. You know, they're listening, they're doing their stuff, but that's my, that's my favorite position is to be nice. on the line. I want to be the guy behind them because I've had my time. I like the nozzle. Don't get me wrong, but I, I want to be mm. helping that next guy or gal be better because if you're not helping the next person be better, what are you here for? Just you. Yeah. Man, that's the, I mean, get past that, man. Get past it. Yeah. No, I like that. I like that a lot. That's uh, well, kind of segue into the second question with that. Uh, the best position in the fire service. For me, it was captain. Yeah. I, I love riding the back, but when I'm, when I made captain, I had two years that I didn't like where I learned everything about disciplinary problems. And then I, I had I had four years as a relief officer in Battalion One, which were phenomenal. And I had seven years on Engine Two, which was I honestly believe as a captain on Engine Two, I learned to be a firefighter there because I had really good people from captains to drivers to firefighters. They were happy to rent two calls or twenty calls. They were jam up. They would pull the hose. They didn't like the way it looked in the back of it. They wanted to do something every day. Wanted to work out every day. They wanted to cook meals every day. They wanted to be together. That was my best time there. I, I'd say eight years at Station 8 was awesome, but my seven and a half years as a captain at Station 2 were probably, bar none, the best. I learned so much. They made me better instructor, better person, uh, very diverse area from high rises to drug dealing areas to the highway to light rail. It was just a phenomenal assignment. I shouldn't even got it. It was like winning the lottery. A 30-year guy left, and nobody nobody put in it for it because they thought a training captain was coming out. And if you're a training captain, you get carte blanche. Nobody put in for it. And I was a relief. I was I had my first permanent assignment for two years, and I put in for it. And I went from a slow station to there. I, I just pinched myself because I had an absolute ball. It was it was it was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, I tell you, man, that I agree. I agree. Being in that spot is is a fantastic position to. Watch your people. You got good people around you doing work and, uh, you know, getting after it. And like I said, you're still getting to get in, engaged and, and do operations. And yeah, it's mostly a busy house of that for sure. For sure. Yeah. And all and all those guys I work with are either retired or promoted. Now. So there's there's one left. But he's still young. He's probably going to get promoted. But it's cool watching them go forward. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So on the topic of people, uh, question number three. This is kind of a two-part question. Uh, the most influential person in your personal life and then in your professional life? Mm. My wife, my personal life, uh, she, she is my rock. She supported me for everything. Even when I was wrong, <laughs> she supported me. Um, she has held the two and a half attack line at the house by herself. 
when things were bad. She has dealt with her own health issues while I was traveling. She didn't tell me she had COVID when I was at the middle of this big project I was working on because she didn't want me to come home. She is my best friend. And I don't have, I have a lot of friends. I consider y'all friends, but I don't have too many people that I can tell the things I tell her. And I consider if you can count on one hand, people that will come back out of jail, <laughs> come get you, answer the phone when you need to talk. Those are, those are true friends. And uh, she has always done that for me. Um, so I challenge firefighters to remember that. If you're married, you better make sure that's the key. Sorry for the emotional side of it. But she says, I cry enough for everybody in the house. Nobody else needs to cry. But, um, she is, she is personally, she is. Professionally, that would be a hard one to narrow down. I, I have so many influences. Um, my dad is the reason I got into it. I would start with him. You know, yeah. um, I got a pretty cool experience recently with my wife. My dad mentioned he wanted to see me teach again. His health is pretty bad. He's not able to get out. Um, my wife brought him to day three of our three-day event in Harrisburg, North Carolina. And he sat in his little walker wheelchair and hung out with us for eight hours and listened and watched and when somebody said well why don't we open the nozzle we go down the hallway where did that come from and he goes i but i'll take the blame that was my generation we did that you know he he uh he was the reason i got into it he's the reason i got into thermal imaging he's the reason i got into a lot of stuff but there are so many people that have influenced me i would spend your 90 minutes just naming names of yeah. the people that have blessed me with their knowledge their experience their mentor mentoring me helping me even when I was out of line, you know, when I started this, I thought I knew something. <laughs> I've, after 13 years of studying, studying thermal imaging cameras, I feel like a caveman holding a flashlight, to quote my friend Jimmy Brown. I don't know but about this much. And we all have a piece of the puzzle, but I am so thankful that I've been around good people like you guys. Who, like every time I, like when I listen to you speak, Sean, or listen to Dennis Laguerre, or anybody I get to listen to, I'm always learning something. And I don't think you should ever quit learning. But professionally, I think the biggest blessing for me in teaching is that I have been able to meet people like y'all and learn from you. And I turn around and whether you know it or not, I'm constantly taking that knowledge and pouring it back into other people. You know, like your searchable stuff and stuff. And, you know, Nick, you and I sat at Firehouse Expo and we had that behavioral health podcast with, with Liska and all those guys. I'm always taking from other people and I quote them, I give them credit. I mean, you know, I, I, but I am blessed to be around such amazing people and the people I work with in my insight training cadre, you better watch out. Those are the rock stars that are coming. I'm nothing. Those guys right there are going to make a huge impact and they're never going to care whether their name is known or not, but they are making huge waves as we call it, disruptive leadership. They're making huge positive ways in their area. And I am I am looking forward to seeing what the future holds for them more than anything. So well said. Yeah, thank you for that, Andy. That's uh I had to mute the microphone and just listen to you speak for a second. So don't apologize for uh any emotional stuff out there. You know, that's yeah, we need more of that, more real yeah. raw stuff. Um well you heard that in West Virginia, so you got you got a good taste of that. <laughs> Yeah, well, and you know, I did. And uh, for anybody who's who's looking for a class, that's probably one of the best presentations in uh, thirty minutes that I heard on on that um, mental health and taking care of yourself and your family stuff. So I would definitely recommend that to anybody else because I know that we had our conversation the day before. I had zero idea that you were giving that talk, and mm -hmm. uh, when you gave it, man, I just I felt like you were talking directly to me. You know, so it, it is a powerful thing and, and more people do need to hear it. So uh, thank you for everything that you're doing in the fire service all the way around. You know, um, I, I don't think that that can go without being noticed by anybody who truly knows you. So um, well, we're meant we're meant to give, gentlemen. That's it. You know, like th this job gives us so much, you know, um, if you let it um, and if you're also not careful, it will take a lot from you. So it is a balance. And uh, I think the best thing that we can do uh, is one, hold each other accountable, check in on each other, make sure we're doing all right. But two, just give a little bit back, 
you know, just give a little bit back because I promise you there's somebody out there fighting a battle that you know nothing about and your words change everything for them. So um, just just be nice. Right. I mean, that that's really all it is. Uh, so I do have my questions for you. Are you ready? All right. Sure. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Do uh, I need more coffee? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, some okay. of these you kind of already <laughs> you kind of already alluded to, but I put some Bailey's in that coffee you. with these questions. <laughs> yeah, something. Uh, I'm gonna get you fired back up here in a second. Don't you? Uh oh. Worry. Oh boy. <laughs> so first off, kind of going back to the training, uh, we know your favorite position. Uh, we we know that. What is your? I was going to ask you what your favorite thermal imaging drill is, but I want to know overall what is what is the drill hands down that you love the most? As far as just training drills and general just training, I mean, it can be anything, anything that 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 is one hundred percent your thing. If you could do anything at all, that's what you want to do. We do a we do a drill that that uh, stops a lot of the fire suppression problems where people don't open the nozzle full enough water, right? And it's called a thermal rebound drill. And all we do is we sit in line with the fire down the hallway. So you have the fire room, you have a big room pushing down a hallway. So you got high pressure to low pressure. And we black it out and we sit. I get on the nozzle and they have cameras. And all of them are sitting behind me. This is TV time. They're just going to watch. I have them look up with their eyesight and they see some smoke moving. I have them take their flashlight, read the smoke, see if they see any movement. And then I say, do you see heat passing you? And I see the convection currents moving past. I say, oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to do what, what you probably saw in training. And I'm a, I briefly open the nozzle and do that dreaded pencil to ceiling for about a second and a half. And I close it. And then I listen. I, mean, look, I just listen to them. And I hear, <gasps> as it goes <sighs> right back. And I'm like, well, that didn't work, did it? Okay, so you heard a hit and move. It just moved past us. Let's try that again. So I'm going to. Z pattern all the way down the ceiling to the door case, but I'm not going to reach into the fire. So I'm going to create a massive cold spot with a really hot fire. And when I do that, it comes down the hallway even faster. I got video of it coming down a hallway, a 35 foot hallway in three and a half seconds after flowing for 20 seconds, 150 GP. And I, I'm back there and I hear them, you know, you see their eyes and their face piece and you go, Yep, they won't go down that hallway with the nozzle closed again. And that's my thing. I, I have I've listened on the radio. I've heard those statements you heard you said earlier, countering high heat conditions, can't find a fire. And I'm going, they're in there with the nozzle closed because they don't see flames and they're dying. Because if you take the buildings we're in with the with the contents we have and black it out and put them in the best gear money can buy, and then we train them to wait till they saw fire or wait till they feel heat. To open the nozzle, we send them to the grave. Because I, I like what Dennis has taught. You know, it's a game of pressures, but it's also the fact that your enemy is shooting millions of heat bullets at you, and you're not shooting back. So I, I, we, I want to create a culture where they shoot back. They shoot back early. They're long range snipers, not pocket knife assass assassins. They're using the reach of the stream. I love that drill. I think it's, I think it, I love seeing the light bulbs go, when we come back out. But I always ask every class what's one thing they got. I believe it or not, half of them say, oh, I like the gangster grip. You know, I'm like, <laughs> like okay, as long as you're going to carry the camera, I'm happy. But but that's my favorite because I actually, you actually see the light bulb where we talked about it in class. You see them go, I get it. I get it. In Kingman, Arizona, 25-year veteran, two months from retirement. I'm outside. I'm not even in the building. Reagan Underwood, one of my instructors, is in there doing the thermal rebound drill. Mm -hmm. And I hear that guy screaming. I thought something was wrong. I come in and peek around the corner. He goes, I get it. I get it. I finally get it. I never understood it, but I've seen it now. I know what I, I know what got me. And I'm like, okay, good. He gets it. <laughs> so I like, awesome. it can, I like it when we can fix something and not yeah. be, not be negative in how we fix it. We're teaching. We're not invalidating people or talking down. We're just demonstrating something. And then they, it clicks for them. That is a cool moment for me. Yeah. So yeah, that's a powerful moment too, mm -hmm. because they're going to pass that on to other people, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's no secret today. Um, we have a lot of people in the fire service, which I think is an awesome thing. Um, mm -hmm. Have a lot of passion. They want to share mm -hmm. that passion. Um, and I just want, I want to get from your words, 
one bit of advice that you would give to an individual like that who who wants to share their passion with the fire service and go down that route of maybe either developing a program or or whatever it may be what would be one thing you would give them to to help them in their endeavor i would tell them this if you are being persecuted if you are being told no if doors are slamming in your face there's a reason and you need to turn towards the open door because the reason doors are being closed to you is not because of your passion, not because you want to do it. You're just looking the wrong direction because I don't teach thermal engineering in my own department. I don't, not allowed to. So I went where the opportunity was and I'm telling you when I go and train, the people that I get to see charge my batteries and kept me from quitting the fire service 10, 11 years. Cause I was done. I was burned out. I was tired of the negativity. I was tired of being told no. I was tired. Of, every time I tried to make a difference, I got door slammed in my face and all that. So for me, uh, that's why I would, I would tell them to turn their passion towards that purpose and find that window. So, I don't know if y'all hear me. My my screen locked up for some reason. Oh, it's okay. I can still hear you. Yeah. No, that's that's yeah. great advice. Um, because I see a lot where people just give up, right? They get frustrated. Yep. Um, they get belittled. Social media is a wonderful thing, but it's also a terrible thing at the same time. Um, you know, so yeah, no, that's great advice. Tell them to keep going and look in a different direction where they feel they they can make that difference. Um, mm -hmm. so you ready to get fired up? I told you I was gonna get sure. Fired up. All right. Sure. Why not? Go for it. So you kind of asked me this question in West Virginia, and um, I, I I don't know if I answered it the way you you uh, wanted me to. So I'm going to re ask you the same question. <laughs> um, <laughs> you gonna turn you gonna turn it on me? Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Go for exactly. it. So we have uh, obviously we talked about this earlier. We have a lot of information today. A lot of data has been collected. Things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so in the way of thermal imaging and, and how that looks for the fire service, what data do you want to see starting to be collected in our fire service so that we can start delivering that in a way that it, it actually helps people? They can really, really look at that and break it down and see, OK, this is not just a simple yes or no question. Right. This has more context to it. And they're able to make us make a case for better training or, or whatever that is. What data would that be for you? Did we lose Andy? I think we lost Andy. Hold on. Let oh, me... no. He got so uh... mad he signed off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hold on. Let me, let me invite him back here real quick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, his camera locked up. I wonder if he uh... <laughs> said, well, he I, might have the wrong I, button. Bring him back because I want to see his face on this. Yeah. Let's see here. All right. I send it again. <laughs> so, right. yeah, no. Uh, you make sure yeah, you get him back. Definitely got to get him back in here. So, that's, dude. That's the zinger question. And then we're going to lock it out on that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's uh, honestly, man, this is, it's it's a hard topic to cram into two hours. It really is. I mean, it's just, there's so much information. And obviously, Andy's a wealth of, <laughs> a wealth of information. So, um, dude, yeah, it's. We, we could spend four days. or five hours days on this topic. So I probably spent three days in West Virginia with Andy not that long ago and uh, talking about thermal imaging and everything else. And, you know, every time I have a conversation with Andy about thermal imaging, I learn more that I didn't know before, which is insane to me how he remembers all of this because he can mm. just spit that out like it's nothing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, it's great. I, I wish we had more people that were able to do the same thing because we have a lot of opinions in yeah. the fire service. We know that. And not everybody is able to articulate things as well as he does. So I'm, I'm glad that he's on the show and that he's sharing this with us because uh, it is something that needs to be talked about. Yeah, no, it's dude. It's yeah. Hands down, hands down. Uh, it, it needs to be discussed more. And honestly, man, like people need to let's see what we got here. There he is. Oh, hey, he's back. In the flesh. Yeah, well, you know, I, I teach technology, and the first things I tell people, technology will fail you. And I share with them how my camera <laughs> failed and how point. I missed a victim and all of that. So they yeah. think I'm going to preach at them. They're wrong. I thought I got but, you so so mad you quit. 
<laughs> no, I'm out. I'm out. No, I, I was actually about to give you about three point answer or three part answer, and then do it. I noticed er everybody was frozen. I went, well, I guess we're done. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. No, I would like to see the the tick studies that were done previously that were groundbreaking at the time, like NIST technical note, uh, the one that 1499, I believe, the one that basically NFB 1801 that was based on. I'd like to see the one on floor studies where they, you know, trying to view the environment uh, with a thermal imaging camera. I'd like to see the thermal classifications that were done by Michelle Donnelly with NIST. I'd like to see some of that stuff updated because the UTEC classification, thermal classification that they keep quoting is from the 1970s. Um, some of that stuff needs to be updated. And I think that the, the video quality of thermal imaging cameras has improved so much that they are not using that new data. They're basing, they've got great research, great thermal couple data, all these gas measurements and all that, but they're using older cameras and it's not producing the quality they could be used, could be getting. So I'd like to see those repeated. Uh, I, you know, because I'm, I, I don't understand why we're doing updated studies with antiquated equipment. That would be my first question. And then for data collection, I'd like to actually, I'd like to see NIFRS or someone actually put like where firefighter rescue survey says, was a tick used? Okay. Let's, let's, let's break that down. Okay. Was a tick used? Did you encounter problems? And I might have to create the own survey myself just to, to provide that information to them. I got to quit complaining and be a part of the solution, right? They're doing phenomenal work to their, their credit. I need to provide them data. Uh, matter of fact, I'm working with somebody on some of that, but like, here's what's your background? What, what camera did you use? Did you encounter problems? Uh, have you had any training? Tell me about your experience. Cause I started collecting testimonials from firefighters the last two years. I've collected about 30 or 40 saves that firefighters have made using cameras from the stuff that we have collectively shared with them. But I'd like to see that data captured. And then I'd like to see actual fire departments realize the following. If you are not training your firefighters on these devices, you are going to be held liable. Period. It's coming. And they're, they're already suing the pants off everybody else in other countries. They've started suing the United States from everything from driving to victims are suing because they didn't find their loved ones. What happens when they realize there's data behind it that shows that, hey, if I'd done this, I could have found your loved one faster, or I missed them because I didn't use it, or I missed them because I used it improperly, right? Right. Uh, I, I don't wish that on the fire service, but litigation and tragedy is what spurs change for us. I mean, look at everything that's happened every time we've had a mass tragedy, there's been change. We need to be proactive, not reactive. And I'd like to see manufacturers, final challenge, quit giving the fire service breadcrumbs. They're giving us dumbed down, lower resolution stuff as a, as a whole. I mean, you look at the cameras now, they're 320 by 240. If you work in the industry, the first thing you're going to pick up is a 640 by 480 camera if you want really decent image quality. If you're doing drone work, you want a 640 by 480. So you're going to tell me, that they're going to start with 300,000 pixel cameras and the best we're going to work with is 80,000. I, I don't think so. I, I think we're past the point of, of, of the, being an issue with technology. It's all about, there's not enough profit margin in it. So we've got to get to the point where we create better products based on end user feedback. And I want firefighters to be so smart and educated that when that salesperson shows up, if they don't know what they're doing, they're going to leave frustrated. If they do know what they're doing, they're going to leave very happy. I, I want an educated marketplace so that firefighters understand that if I put this much time inspecting my turnout gear and the fire truck that I need to spec this device because this device can save the citizen's life, the property and mine on my crews. And that's worth my time. That's worth a few hours of training every so often. And it becomes a part of your PPE. And by the way, if you don't believe that, NFPA 1801, the 2021 standard, has a clause in there for a mass-mounted tick. So why would they put that in there unless a manufacturer is planning mm. on making an NFPA certified <clears throat> camera, which means a mass-mounted camera that's going to be at least 320 by 240 and meet the specs in there, which would be way better quality than what we currently have, which allows you, Sean, to search with your hands and not carry a camera. Think about how much faster you're going to be. So oh, yeah. it's, it's a big answer but and a big ask, but I think it's a generational change that's going to require a lot of stuff on our end. But mostly, 
we're going to have to upgrade. First thing we're going to do is upgrade the fire service to, to 2010. I go around and see fire departments that are still operating with cameras from 2000. You know, I, I got to get them 10 years ahead to get them. I mean, we're not even in 2020 with them yet. And, you know, I don't understand why they're against upgrading technology other than spending money. So. Oh, that's great answer. Couldn't have asked for anything better. You know, and I would like to see all those things too, you know, because I think it's important, um, not just for civilians, but for firefighters. Um, you know, when, when you're talking about the fact that 100% of the time, if we're disoriented inside of the building and I use a camera, I can find my way out. That's huge. Right. That's a big, that's a big deal to me. So uh, the second step is training us how to use it and getting us the proper equipment. So thank you for your time today, Andy. I really appreciate you coming on. I know you had a long day. So uh, <laughs> thanks for carving out a little over two hours for us. I ain't done yet, gentlemen. I got more stuff to do. <laughs> oh. Well, Grind, let, grinding let, us, let us let you go grab a beer or whatever it is you got to do. And, no, uh, I gotta, I gotta figure out dinner for the family. I got emails to answer. I got a dog that's been locked up for two hours, <laughs> and I got, I, I got, uh, I got a daughter that I hadn't seen in half a day. I'm gonna aggravate her, and I got a new camera to play with, and you know, just a few things. But just a few. Yeah, I need yeah, just a few. Yeah, I owe my wife some front, some front porch time and a good cup of coffee because it's actually. It's actually pretty enough today to sit outside. Man. Well, so, don't, well, don't let us keep you from that, brother. Goal number one. No, but thank you for <laughs> what y'all are doing. And do me a favor, would you? I, I got one. I got a challenge for both of you. Sure. You both Send both it. are young, younger than me, and you both have extremely passion, and you're doing the right thing. But I need you to do me a favor. I need you to keep doing what you're doing. You're not going to do that unless you keep you a group of people around you, whether they're local or not to keep your batteries charged because you will burn out you will become cynical and you'll quit and if you want to find the quickest way to become bitter and cynical is take take the gift that god gave you and quit using it because of circumstances when you quit using that gift everybody suffers so don't don't stop okay and when you get burnt out get back around those groups get back in i call them my board of directors i have a virtual one that keeping me straight for since 2014 and we chat like schoolgirls on this little phone we have a little app but i met all those guys teaching and i mean i flew to jersey for one of them's 40th birthday party because that's that's they they keep me going and i i challenge you to do the same just don't the fire service needs people to to provide hope and encouragement not just in skills right but in who you are and that's what I tell people all the time when you go and teach, yeah, your data and your knowledge is great, but they're paying to hear you, your passion, your purpose, the reason behind it. So keep doing that and don't don't quit and give your family their due because I think the greatest disservice we do is we pour our entire passion into all this. In the day, we're just spent. We got nothing for that kid or our wife. Mm -hmm. And and we got to, you got to have two separate battery cells, gentlemen. You got to have a battery charge for the fire service and you got to have a bigger battery charge for your family because I'm going to hang the fire chief hat up, battalion chief hat up. Not going to hang up the dad and the husband hat, not by the grace of God. So don't don't forget that, okay? I appreciate both of you. Yes, sir. Hope, hope you have a good evening and look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully. Absolutely, yes, brother. Well, Enjoy thanks for your time work. today. Yeah, man. Have a good one. Take care.